Eastern Tuesday morning. Join the discussion. Now, the confirmation hearing for nominees picked to serve on the 6th and 7th Circuit Court of Appeals. Their testimony is followed by other nominees for District Court in Tennessee and the Justice Department's Civil Rights Division. This hearing was held by the Senate Judiciary Committee. It's three and a half hours. We appreciate everybody being here. Yeah, I turned it on. And uh, especially welcome the nominees and their families to today's uh, nomination hearing. This is the 10th nomination hearing the committee has held this year. I want to take a minute to thank uh, Ranking Member and her staff for working diligently with my staff and this senator to process these nominees, uh, filling judicial vacancies and executive appointments is an important part of this committee's responsibility and I know that all members of the committee take this responsibility seriously. Today we'll hear from two panels. First we'll hear from the nominees uh, to the circuit court, Notre Dame law professor Amy Barrett and Michigan Supreme Court Justice Joan Larson. Our second panel we'll hear from Eric Dreisman to be uh, head of the Civil Rights Division in the Department of Justice. We'll also hear from two nominees to the district court judges in Tennessee. I understand that there is some concern with having two circuit court nominees on a hearing agenda, so I thought I'd explain this because it's unusual. When the majority leader extended the Senate schedule into August, we scheduled a nomination hearing to be considered for Professor Barrett's nomination, and that was scheduled to be August 9th. That hearing was postponed when the Senate went into recess a week earlier than previously scheduled, so I decided to make up for that hearing that we lost in August to combine Professor Barrett's hearing with the, today's hearing. Of course, I aim to be fair in the process and make sure that the other side have ample time to review these nomination uh, qualifications. We've had Professor Baird's material for 120 days and Justice Larson's material for 96 days. I believe this is more than enough time for thorough review. But it's also important to note that holding a hearing with multiple Supreme Court nominees is nothing new. In fact, every committee chairman since I joined the committee 36 years ago has held hearings with multiple circuit court nominees, and even before that, Chairman Kennedy had one hearing with seven circuit court nominees. Today's nominees are indeed important, as are the positions to which they're nominated. As an accommodation to the minority, I'm happy to give Senators seven minutes for the first round of questioning for the first panel, rather than the standard five. And of course, I'll make sure that Senators are allowed to ask as many rounds of questions as they'd like to in order to ensure everybody having their questions answered. Now, Senator Feinstein. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. And I'd also like to welcome our nominees and their families and friends to the Senate Judiciary Committee today. Um, as you have correctly stated, we consider four judicial nominees as well as Eric Dryband's nomination to lead the Justice Department's Civil Rights Division. Now, a number of troubling developments have occurred in the past month, and I think they have implications for the nominees and nominations that we're considering today. Today, we're evaluating a nominee to lead the Civil Rights Division against the backdrop of what happened in Charlottesville in August, when neo-Nazis and white supremacists gathered at a Unite at the Right rally and violence ensued. As everybody knows, a woman named Heather Heyer was killed by one of the rally attendees driving his car directly and intentionally into a crowd, which killed 32-year-old Heather and injured 19 others. Now, most public officials condemned this violence and condemned the hateful ideology that motivated it. 
The president did not initially. Instead, he said there is blame on both sides. And I think I found that a really shocking statement. And I think it's, it's, it's applicable here to the extent that it affects a nominee's uh, service in the civil rights area. Because there are not two sides when one side contains neo-Nazis and white supremacists. These are ideologies that people across America and the world died in a war fighting to defeat Nazism. I think Senator, distinguished Senator Hatch said, you know, his brother died in World War II fighting Nazism. So there isn't any good in Nazism. And Mr. Dryband, I'm going to be specifically interested in your views on what the Civil Rights Division would do under your leadership to enforce our laws against hate crimes and to combat racial and religious discrimination wherever it is found. Additionally, President Trump pardoned former Maricopa County Sheriff Joe Arpaio in August. Now, my views on this are very clear. I'm a former mayor. I know a little bit about racial profiling. I know the struggle that we've had in police departments, including my own, uh, to prevent that from continuing. And many of us feel that Joe Orpaio should not have been pardoned. He brazenly defied a federal judge's court order to stop racial profiling and continued to do so until being convicted of criminal contempt. A pardon for that kind of conduct demonstrates some disregard for the rule of law in this country. The Justice Department's Civil Rights Division, the division that Mr. Dryband has been nominated to leave, found that Sheriff Arpaio systematically violated the civil rights of the people he was charged with serving and protecting for years. President Trump indicated that he approves of that behavior with this decision, which in my view serves only to deepen the divisions in our country. I'm interested in what Mr. Dryband and our judicial nominees think about the Arpaio pardon and what message they think such a pardon sends to people about the importance of complying with court orders, which is critical to the rule of law. I'm also interested in what message Mr. Dryband believes this sent to minorities across the country. When the president eagerly exonerates an officer of the law who systematically violated the rights of people of color with impunity. I believe the president has sent an unmistakable message to law enforcement that racial profiling is an acceptable police practice and that should concern us all. So today we'll consider the nominations of two circuit court nominees, Professor Amy Coney Barrett to the Seventh Circuit Court and Justice Joan Larson to the Sixth. Circuit Court nominations are extremely important. If confirmed, Professor Barrett and Justice Larson would sit on courts that are just one step below the United States Supreme Court. And because the Supreme Court hears so few cases each year, the courts of appeals are really the last word and last resort for most people in many of these cases. The committee, Mr. Chairman, will fully and fairly review each of these nominees. I thank you and um, look forward to the hearing. Thank you very much. Now we'll call on our colleagues, first Senator Corker to introduce his nominees and then Senator Young for his nominee. I should say the president's nominees and you're here to support them. Yes, sir. Well, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member, I uh, thank you both for allowing us to be here. I know Senator Young and I both serve on the Foreign Relations Committee, and we're, we're glad to be on the hallowed ground of this Judiciary Committee, and thank you for the way that you conduct your business. It's my pleasure to introduce two Tennesseans uh, to the committee today, and I'd like to thank President Trump and his team for making such excellent nominations and prioritizing Tennessee. First, I'd like to introduce Thomas Lee Robinson Parker, 
President Trump's nominee for the United States District Court Judge for the Western District of Tennessee. I am pleased to welcome Tommy and all those who are here supporting him, him, him today, his wife, Allison, and his three daughters, Catherine, Annie, and Ellen, should be very proud. I uh, understand Ellen stayed home. She's the most studious. I think she stayed home to go to school, but the other two daughters are here. Tommy attended the University of Tennessee and the University of South Carolina and went on to earn his law degree from Vanderbilt University School of Law. He has a distinguished legal career as a litigator and a former federal prosecutor in Memphis. The American Bar Association uh, unanimously rated him well qualified and I'm confident that he understands the proper role of a judge and will faithfully uphold the law. His experience in civil and criminal matters will serve the Western District of Tennessee well. Tennessee also, Tommy also has a record of service to his community, including serving on the Board of Directors at the Court Appointed Special Advocate Association, the Volunteer Center of Memphis and Youth Villages. I wholeheartedly support his nomination and thank this committee for holding this hearing and encourage my colleagues to support his confirmation. Next, I would like to introduce William Chip Campbell, President Trump's nominee for the United States District Court Judge for the Middle, Tennis, Middle District uh, of Tennessee. I'd also like to acknowledge his wife, Anastasia, his son, John, and his parents, Beth and Bill Campbell, who are with him here today. A native of Nashville, Chip attended Franklin Road Academy before entering the U.S. Naval Academy, where he earned a commission in the U.S. Marine <coughs> Corps and became a Naval Flight Officer. After his military service, Chip attended law school at the University of Alabama, where he received multiple academic honors and served as the editor-in-chief of the Alabama Law Review. Upon completion of law school, he joined a Birmingham law firm, but later returned to Tennessee and became a partner at, the Nashville, at a Nashville law firm. The American Bar Association also unanimously rated Chip well qualified. I am confident he will faithfully uphold the Constitution and impartially apply the law, and I believe his experience will benefit the Middle District greatly. In addition to his distinguished career as a litigator, Chip has demonstrated a commitment to the Nashville community. He is a member of Covenant Presbyterian Church, where he teaches Sunday school and, is also, and also volunteers this time, guiding prospective National, Nash, Naval Academy applicants through the admissions process. I congratulate Chip on his nomination and urge my colleagues to support his nomination. I would like to mention, if I could, the Middle District has lost two active and two senior judges since November of 2016, and the two remaining judges now carry a weighted caseload of 780 per judgeship. I know uh, Senator Coons has worked hard on this issue. This is the fourth highest caseload of any district with a judicial emergency. If you might uh, take that into account as you move both of these nominees through, I'd appreciate it. Again, I appreciate President Trump, the committee, moving quickly on these nominations and look forward to working with you to see all the judicial nominees for Tennessee confirmed as quickly as possible. Senator Alexander wanted to be here also, but he's chairing a hearing right now on helping Americans in the individual insurance market. If there's no objection, I'd ask that his remarks be entered into the record uh, by unanimous consent. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Ranking Member. Thank you for committee members. And uh, I'm very proud to be able to stand with you with these nominees. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Senator Corker. And uh, I don't think we ask members questions, so you're free to stay or go whatever you want to do. I think you're telling me to leave, and I, I, I uh, <laughs> wish you it. well. Thank you. I, I never tell another senator what to do. I ask him what to do. <laughs> uh, senator Young. Well, thank you, Chairman Grassley and Ranking Member Feinstein. It really is my honor and uh, privilege to be here today and introduce and offer my strongest support for Amy Comey Barrett, uh, who has been nominated by this president to serve on the U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals for the Seventh Circuit. As you can see, Professor Barrett comes before this committee today not only with my support, but with the strong support of her family. Her husband, Jesse, her parents, Michael and Linda Coney, and her seven children, three of whom are with us today. 
I'd like to add before I touch on just a, a few of Professor Barrett's many professional accomplishments that when we first met, it was incredibly clear to me that uh, Amy Barrett would prefer at heart to talk about her family than to brag on her own professional accomplishments. While putting together her very impressive career, Ms. Barrett and her devoted husband have been busy raising uh, seven children. In her conversations, um, she, she gushed about <coughs> them, and um, I just respect all she's been able to accomplish uh, while raising such uh, beautiful and, and uh, uh, well-behaved children who had, had an opportunity to meet earlier. With that said, being nominated to serve in a lifetime appointment for a U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals is a privilege few in the legal profession ever attain. Professor Barrett is eminently qualified to serve in that role, and she brings a skill set and temperament to excel as an appellate judge. She's a distinguished legal scholar at Notre Dame Law School with dozens of articles and presentations on the powers and procedures of federal courts. Professor Barrett graduated summa cum laude from the law school at the University of Notre Dame, where she served as editor of the Notre Dame Law Review and earned the Hoynes Prize, and that's the top award for a, stu uh, a student at that law school. She clerked for Justice Antonin Scalia on the U.S. Supreme Court and then litigated constitutional law cases then taught at George Washington University and the University of Virginia before returning to Notre Dame. As a professor, she's published in such prominent publications as Columbia Law Review, Virginia Law Review, Texas Law Review, and Cornell Law Review. Her scholarship is focused on stare decisis, appellate procedure, canons of construction, judicial authority, and congressional power. In recognition of her expertise, she was appointed by Chief Justice Roberts, a fellow Hoosier, to the Federal Judiciary's Advisory Committee on Appellate Rules, and was selected by peers to serve as the incoming chair of the Federal Courts Section of the American Association of Law Schools. Since being nominated for this position, the plaudits have come pouring in. A group of 450 of her former students wrote to this committee, saying, quote, our support is driven not by politics, but by the belief that Professor Barrett is supremely qualified. All 49 of her fellow faculty members at Notre Dame Law School did the same, saying that while, quote, we have a wide range of political views, as well as commitments to different approaches to judici judicial methodology and judicial craft, we are united, however, in our judgment about Amy. The American Bar Association rates her as well qualified, and her fellow Supreme Court law clerks unanimously endorsed her, as well as dozens of fellow professors of law from around the country. I take the Senate's role of nominating and confirming quality candidates to the federal courts very seriously, and couldn't be more pleased that Professor Barrett is the first nominee from the Hoosier State that this committee will consider, and hopefully the whole Senate will consider. Republicans and Democrats alike are praising the pick. And this is a historic opportunity, as Professor Barrett would be the first Hoosier women, woman rather, to have a seat on the Seventh Circuit Court. Thank you for this opportunity to speak out on behalf of Professor Barrett and to give my highest recommendation in support of our nomination to the U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals for the Seventh Circuit. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member Feinstein once again. Uh, thank you, Senator Young. There are two people that uh, uh, colleagues weren't able to introduce, so I'm going to do that. Michigan Supreme Court Justice Joan Larson is nominated for the U.S. Court of Appeals, Sixth Circuit. Justice Larson's nomination is supported by a broad coalition of lawyers, judges, academic colleagues. She is well qualified to serve the people of the Sixth Circuit and the committee has received several letters in support of her nomination. I ask that one of those letters from former government officials, including officials of the Obama administration, be entered into the record at this point without objection. That will be done. Even though she li currently lives in Michigan, Justice Larson hails from my state of Iowa. She graduated from the University of Northern Iowa in 1990 
uh, and that's about 44 years after I got a uh, degree from the same university that then was called Iowa State Teachers College. Then she went to attend the Northwestern University School of Law. Justice Larson began her legal career clerking for Justice Centel of the D.C. Circuit and Justice Scalia on the Supreme Court. After clerking, she entered private practice, spending two years with the law firm Sidney Austin. Justice Larson has taught constitutional law and criminal law at the University of Michigan Law School since 1998, where she has earned the respect of faculty members and students alike. She won the L. Hart Wright Award for Excellence in Teaching early in her career. In addition to her teaching responsibility, Justice Larson ran Michigan's clerkship program, helping hundreds of students and alumni pursue clerkships at the federal and state level. As an adjunct professor, she continues to run the law school's moot court program. A group of her colleagues there have sent a letter in support of her nomination, and I ask unanimous consent that it be included in the record. Without objection, that will be done. She also served as a visiting professor at the University of Iowa College of Law and Northwestern School of Law. Justice Larson served as Deputy Assistant Attorney General in the Office of Legal Counsel, working to provide uh, legal advice to the president and executive agencies uh, on difficult issues of constitutional law and statutory interpretation. In 2015, Michigan Governor Snyder appointed Justice Larson to the Supreme, Michigan Supreme Court. She was elected to the position in her own right in 2016 uh, by a resounding majority outside of the courtroom. Justice Larson is actively involved in volunteer work uh, to serve uh, disadvantaged children, and she works uh, very much uh, in, in Michigan's veteran drug program, um, as well as the mental health programs. Uh, welcome to you and your family, Justice Larson. Uh, Eric Dreisband is nominated to be Assistant Attorney General of the Civil Rights Division, DOJ. Uh, he has a JD degree from Northwestern University School of Law, 92. He then clerked for Justice William Bauer, on the Seventh Circuit in 94, Mr. Dreisman joined Meyer, Brown, and Platt in Chicago. In 97, he served as an associate independent counsel in that position. He worked as a federal prosecutor, closely coordinating the Federal Bureau of Investigation and other federal agencies. After briefing, briefly returning to private practice in 2000, he joined the U.S. Department of Labor in the Wage and Hour Division 2002. Then he served as Deputy Administrator enforcing federal labor laws such as the Fair Labor Standards Act and the Family and Medical Leave Act until accepting a position as General Counsel at the uh, EEOC in 2003. He left that agency 2005 joining Aiken Gump, Gump in D.C. and then joined the Washington D.C. firm of Jones Dave as a partner in 2008. Mr. Dreisman has dedicated a significant portion of his career to working for the U.S. government, enforcing federal employment and labor laws, such as the Age Discrimination and Employment Act, Title VII of the Civil Rights Act, the Family and Medical Leave Act, and the Fair Labor Standards Act, which affects millions of Americans every day. He's been recognized as, quote, the top-rated employment litigation attorney, end of quote, by D.C. super lawyers, and as a... Uh, Band one labor and employment uh, attorney uh, in Chambers, uh, USA, for the last two years. I'm confident that his extensive experience as litigator and his uh, career in government service will help lead to civil uh, lead him to help uh, run the civil rights division. I'm going to ask our two uh, nominees to come now, and before you sit, I would like to swear you. Senator Young, I'm sorry I didn't tell you you could go as a freshman. Good being with you, Chairman. Thank you. 
you've learned an important rule. You get out of here just as fast as you can. Uh, would you uh, raise, uh, do you affirm that the testimony you're about to give before the committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Both have affirmed. Please be seated, and we'll start with Ms. Barrett. Uh, you uh, go ahead and uh, say any statements you want to and uh, any uh, introduction of family and friends and then we'll go to Joan Larson to do the same thing. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, push the red button or whatever color it is. Got it. <laughs> um, thank you, Chairman Grassley. Um, I'd like to thank Senator Young for that kind introduction and Chairman Grassley and Ranking Member Feinstein. I'm grateful to both of you and to the committee for taking the time to consider my nomination. Um, I'm also grateful to President Trump for honoring me with this nomination. I don't have an opening statement, but I would like to introduce my special guests. Um, first and foremost, behind me is my husband, Jesse. Uh, Jesse serves our country as an assistant United States attorney in the Northern District of Indiana. And I hit the jackpot when I married Jesse. We've been married for 18 years, with each year better than the last. Um, Jesse and I have seven children, as Senator Young mentioned. Um, we have our oldest three daughters with us today. Um, Emma is 16, uh, the first apple of our eye, which I'm having trouble finding at the moment. Vivian, directly next to Emma, is 13. Um, Vivian is our miracle. Vivian joined our family. She was born in Haiti, and she came home when she was 14 months old. Um, she weighed 11 pounds, and she was so weak, we were told that she might never walk normally or speak. Today, Vivian is a track star, and I assure you, she has no trouble talking. Um, Tess, sitting next to Vivian, is also 13 years old, both in eighth grade, and she's one of the most compassionate and determined uh, people that I know. Um, our four, ch four children at home um, are with friends and fearless babysitters. John Peter is 10, and like Vivian, John Peter was born in Haiti. He joined our family in uh, 2010 when he was three years old after the devastating earthquake in Haiti. Um, Liam is eight, uh, typically curious eight-year-old, and Juliet is our spunky six-year-old. Benjamin, our youngest, is five, and Benjamin has special needs, and that presents unique challenges for all of us. But I think all you need to know about Benjamin's place in the family is summed up by the fact that the other children unreservedly identify him as their favorite sibling. Um, I also have with me my parents, Mike and Linda Coney. They've traveled from Louisiana, where I was born and raised, Senator Kennedy. Um, and it is impossible to overstate the impact that their support and example have had in my life. Um, and last but certainly not least is Judge Lawrence Silberman. Judge Silberman has served on the D.C. Circuit for 32 years, and I had the great privilege of clerking for him. And Judge Silberman has taught me so much just about the role of federal courts in our system, and I greatly admire him both as a person and a judge, and it means a lot to me to have him here with you as I testify today. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Professor Barrett. Now, Justice Larson. Um, thank you, Chairman Grassley, uh, Ranking Member Feinstein, and the rest of the committee for considering my nomination. I'd also like to thank the President uh, for honoring me with this nomination. I also uh, don't have a statement, but I would like to introduce my family and friends who are here today. Um, the first is my husband of 20 years, Adam Pritchard, who's been with me every step of the way uh, as I left the relatively calm life of legal academia to take on the very hectic life of a statewide elected official. Um, and now as I have entered this new process. Uh, my two children, uh, Liza, who's 17, and Ben, who is 12, uh, are also here with me today. When I was interviewed by the American Bar Association for this process, they asked me, what are you most proud of? And I think they were expecting me to say something about the law, but I said, my kids. I told the truth. My sister, Jean Snack, and her husband, Randy, both Iowa natives, um, came in from Rockford, Illinois, and I am incredibly grateful for their support. My other sister, Christine, couldn't be with us today. She is a public school teacher in Minnesota, and the school year just began, so she could not make the trip. My incredible parents, Leonard and Dolores Larson, who are truly the rocks of our family, 
uh, are in their late 80s uh, and couldn't make the trip. Uh, they are both watching, we hope, if we were able to figure out the technology with them, uh, from their home in Des Moines, Iowa, where I was very lucky to grow up. Uh, lastly, I have three members of the judiciary with me here today. Uh, first, Judge uh, David Santel of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit. I was fortunate enough to clerk for Judge Sentel in 1993, straight out of law school. He taught me so much about the rule of law, about respect for the co-equal branches of government, and for the important work that judges do. And I'm very grateful to have him here. Uh, I also have with me from Michigan uh, one of my colleagues on the Michigan Supreme Court, Justice David Viviano, and his sister, uh, Judge Kathy Viviano, who serves on the Macomb County Circuit Court. I have been very grateful to them and to the whole Viviano family for the friendship that they have shown me through these years. Uh, I also noticed in the gallery some of my former students and former colleagues from the Justice Department, so I'm incredibly grateful to have them here as well. Thank you. Thank you. I'll start with questions, and I said we have seven minute first round. Uh, Professor Barrett, I'm going to start with you. Uh, you've been outspoken about your role uh, and your Catholic faith uh, and, the, and what that plays in your life. Uh, and you've thought and written about the role your faith should play in your profession. So I'd like to specifically discuss a law review article you wrote during law school entitled, quote, Catholic Judges in Capital Cases, end of quote. In this article, you seem to suggest that Catholic judges are, quote, morally precluded from enforcing the death penalty, end of quote. However, you also wrote that, quote, judges cannot and should not try to align our legal system with the church's moral teachings whenever the two diverge. Uh, first question, you've had a couple decades of experience since you wrote this to consider this issue further. Will you elaborate on these statements and discuss how you're, you view the issue of faith versus fulfilling the responsibilities as a judge today? Uh, when is it proper for a judge to put their religious views above applying the law? Thank you, Chairman Grassley. Um, let me start with your very last question and say never. It's never appropriate for a judge to impose that judge's personal convictions, whether they derive from faith or anywhere else on the law. Um, this article that I wrote as a law student has gotten a lot of attention since my nomination, so I'd like the opportunity to put it in context. Um, I wrote that Law Review article when I was a third-year law student with one of my professors 20 years ago. It was a project that he had underway, and he invited me to work on it with him. And I was complimented that, as a student, he thought I was up to the task of being more than a research assistant. Um, but I was very much the junior partner in our collaboration, and that was appropriate given our relative statures. Um, would I or could I say that sitting here today that that article in its every particular reflects how I think about these questions today with, as you say, the benefit of 20 years of experience and also the ability to speak solely in my own voice? No, it would not. But I continue to stand and vehemently believe the core proposition of that article which is that if there is ever a conflict between a judge's personal conviction and that judge's duty under the rule of law, that it is never, ever permissible for that judge to follow their personal convictions in the decision of a case rather than what the law requires. Um, that, that article emphasized that point repeatedly, and I adhere to that today. See, nobody started the clock. I didn't mean this on purpose, but somebody needs to start the clock. So, oh, there it goes. Uh, if you're now follow up, if you're confirmed, how will you decide when you need to recuse yourself? Then I have two more questions for you. Yes, um, Senator, I would fully and faithfully apply the law of recusal, including the federal recusal statute, 28 U.S.C. 455, the canons of judicial conduct. Um, what I can tell you is that sitting here today. I can't think of any cases or a category of cases in which I would feel obliged to recuse on grounds of conscience. Okay. Uh, you've written and spoken much about the legal doctrines related to precedent and stare decisis, 
Please describe how you understand circuit court judges to be bound by president of the Supreme Court and your understanding of stare decisis. I understand circuit judges to be absolutely bound by the president of the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court has held in a case called Rodriguez de Quias that that obligation is absolute that circuit court judges are not um, permitted, for example, to anticipate overrulings of the court and jump the gun. Um, circuit courts are absolutely obligated to follow Supreme Court precedent. And as well, circuit courts are bound to follow the precedent of their own circuit according to the circuit's doctrine of stare decisis. And for example, in the Seventh Circuit, that means that judges follow precedent unless there are extraordinary circumstances that justify its overruling. Okay. And lastly, uh, as we just discussed, circuit court judges are required to follow all Supreme Court precedent. If confirmed, would you follow Supreme Court precedent involving abortion? Absolutely, I would. Okay, now, Justice Larson. During the Supreme Court hearing earlier this year, we discussed at length the proper role of a judge and the importance of judicial independence. The separation of powers in our system requires an independent judiciary made of judges respectful of the other two branches, but not beholden to those branches. As I said in the Supreme Court hearing, judges must be equally dependent, independent of the president who nominates them and the senators who confirm them. Um, so Justice Larson, please describe what judicial independence means to you and tell us whether you have any trouble ruling against the president who appointed you. Uh, thank you for the question, Chairman Grassley. Uh, I would have absolutely no trouble ruling against the president who appointed me, um, or any successor president as well. Uh, judicial independence means one thing, one very simple thing, and that is putting the law above everything else. The statutes passed by this body and the Constitution of the United States. Uh, so I would have absolutely no trouble, and indeed that would be my duty. Yeah. We've often heard these words, uh, especially since January, quote, unquote, now more than ever, we need judges who will be independent of the president who nominated them. So I'd like to ask about your nomination and your independence. A lot, or much has been made about the list of judges then candidate Trump proposed as possible nominees. Of course, you were on that list. So I'm curious, what did you, when did you first learn that you were on the president's list? Um, I can't tell you the exact date, but it was, a complete, it was the date it was announced. <laughs> uh, I just don't know what date that was. Um, it was a complete surprise to me. We were having a public hearing to hang the portrait of one of uh, my former colleagues on the Michigan Supreme Court. Um, and the way I learned about it is that uh, first my colleague, Justice Viviano, um, said to me, hey, you're on a list. And then my phone started just exploding with texts, and that's how I learned. Okay. Uh, tell me about the process that led to your nomination. Did anyone ask you to make any promises or assurances whatsoever about your view of certain legal issues on the way, or the way that you would rule in certain cases? Absolutely not, and if I had been asked, I never would have committed to any such uh, promise. Okay. Uh, you served as Deputy Assistant Attorney General, Office of Legal Counsel, uh, for the years 02 and 03. The Office of Legal Counsel is the preeminent office within justice that advises the President, and by extension the entire executive branch, on the issues of constitutional statutory interpretation. The office issues opinions that are binding on all executive branch agencies. During the Bush administration, that office wrote the now defunct torture memos. Did you have any role in writing or reviewing these memos? No, I did not. Did you work on any matters involving torture or rendition while at OLC? No, I did not. To the extent they are not privileged, would you share a few of the matters you worked on while at OLC? Sure. Um, so my published opinions uh, have been made available to the committee. Um, they involve uh, one question was whether 
executive branch agencies could procure printing services uh, outside of the government printing office, and if they chose to do so, whether um, the government printing office could still uh, be relied on uh, to produce copies for depository agencies. Uh, one involved whether the EEOC could impose monetary sanctions for failure to comply with administrative law judge orders. Uh, one involved whether or not the uh, attorney general, rather than the grand jury, could issue a subpoena. Um, and uh, I concluded that the statute said that the attorney general could issue the subpoena, but the grand jury could not, because that's what the statute said. Okay. Thank you. Now, Senator Feinstein. Thank <clears throat> Thanks very much, um, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I would just like to say, Professor, that on a personal level, um, you're amazing to have seven children and do what you do. And as I watch the faces of these children, I can see uh, that they very much care about their mother. And all those vibrations are very good. So um, I, I just wanted to say that to you. It, it's quite a family. I have trouble with one. So <laughs> yeah, my admiration for you with seven um, is, you. is quite strong. Um, <clears throat> You are controversial, and let's start with that. You're controversial because many of us that have lived our lives as women um, really recognize the value of finally being able to control our reproductive systems. And Roe entered into that, obviously. Um, I listened to your answers to uh, Senator Grassley's question, and it leaves me a bit puzzled. Uh, because you have a long history um, of believing uh, that your religious uh, beliefs should prevail. Let me ask a question. In a 2013 article, you argued that the force of Supreme Court super precedence does not, and this is the quote, does not derive from any decision by the court, but rather because litigants don't challenge the decisions. You listed... Supreme Court super precedents, but you left out Roe v. Wade. You suggested that Roe is not a super precedent because litigants continue to challenge it. However, as a textbook co-authored by Justice Neil Gorsuch last year points out, Roe is super precedent because it has survived more than three dozen attempts to overturn it. So in evaluating super precedents, why did you solely focus on the fact that Roe has been challenged by litigants on so many occasions and not on the fact that the Supreme Court has repeatedly reaffirmed Roe in literally dozens of decisions? Thank you, Senator Feinstein. Um, that wasn't my list. I was addressing arguments that had been made by other professors, serious, well-respected scholars like Richard Fallon at Harvard and Michael Gerhardt at North Carolina. And it wasn't my list. I was quoting them, and I was quoting their definition of super precedent. One thing I would observe is that for a court of appeals, all Supreme Court precedent is super precedent. Um, so as I said to Chairman Grassley, as a Court of Appeals judge, if I were confirmed, I would follow all Supreme Court precedent without fail. Okay, second question. In Planned Parenthood v. Casey, the Supreme Court reaffirmed Roe and listed four factors <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> that must be considered before the court overturned precedent. One of the factors the court listed was a reliance interest meaning that the court would consider whether overturning precedent would create a special hardship because people had planned their lives in reliance on the decision. In 2003, you wrote that in deciding to overturn precedent, reliance interests should, quote, count far less when precedent clearly exceeds a court's interpretive authority, end quote. Give us an example of a Supreme Court precedent that exceeded the court's interpreted authority. Is Roe an example? Senator, I confess that I don't recall the quote that you read to me, and I think I would need to see it in context to fully address your question about that quote. Um, as for your question about Roe, 
I think that the line that other nominees before the committee have drawn in refraining from comment about their agreement or disagreement or the merits or demerits of any Supreme Court precedent is a prudent one because I would commit, if confirmed, to follow unflinchingly all Supreme Court precedent and I would not want to leave the impression that I would give some precedents less weight than others because of any kind of you know, academic disagreement with one. Well, how do you evaluate the precedent, plural, mm -hmm. with respect to Roe? The Supreme Court yes. precedents? Yes. Um, well, Roe and Casey and its progeny, as you say, Roe has been affirmed many times and survived many challenges in the court. And it's more than 40 years old, and it's clearly binding um, on all courts of appeals. And so it's not open to me or up to me, and I would, I would have no interest in, as a court of appeals judge, challenging that precedent. It would bind. Well, let me ask one other question on reliance interest. What do you understand women's reliance interest to be in the right to privacy, which is protected by Roe? Well, Senator, as um, you mentioned in Casey, the court in evaluating um, the stare decisis question weighed, the court itself weighed women's reliance interests in, in planning their reproductive lives. And so the court said that in Casey, and that's clearly the reliance interest that's been recognized in Supreme Court doctrine. And you accept that? Yes, as I expect, accept all Supreme Court doctrines. Okay. Um, thank you. Let me turn to... Uh, Judge Larson, if I may, um, just, ex excuse me, Justice Larson, um, you were a deputy at the Office of Legal Counsel during the Bush administration. While you were there, the office issued several opinions that relied on sweeping theories of executive power to justify the use of torture and other enhanced interrogation techniques. During um, Many of those so-called torture memos were later discredited and withdrawn. Did you have any role in drafting, reviewing, or otherwise contributing to the torture memos? No, I did not, Senator. Um, I did not even know that they were being produced in our office. Um, national security matters in the Justice Department are a close hold as for good reason. Um, and the first I learned of the torture memos, or even that that was a question in our office, was when uh, it hit the newspapers. And at that time, I was back in Michigan uh, as a private citizen. Well, if I recall correctly, that was approximately 2006. When that, um, now, now, those of us that who might served be right. on this committee um, had asked to see these opinions and, of course, were denied the opinions in the early days when they were written. Uh, but when you found out, did you express any concern about them to any of your OL OLC colleagues and anyone in o OLC or department leadership? Uh, well, I was back uh, teaching at the University of Michigan Law School. I was not in government at the time. Uh, I read about them in the newspapers, just like uh, anyone else. Um, so I, I didn't really think it was my place to contact OLC leadership at that so point. So you had no role in drafting, reviewing, or otherwise contributing to memos on interrogation practices, detention policies and practices, rendition, warrantless wiretapping, or any other topics related to the war on terror? So as to all of the first, I would say no. As to any topic related to the war on terror, I, one of my published opinions, for example, is an interpretation of the Patriot Act, um, asking whether or not the Patriot Act authorizes grand juries to issue subpoenas to foreign banks. If, is that a, an opinion related to the war on terror? I'm not sure. Um, but I want to well, answer your question you, as faithfully as I can. Yeah, let me give you one example. Yeah, I understand that you were involved in drafting one memo related to detention and habeas corpus. Can you describe that memo and the nature of your involvement? Uh, Senator Feinstein, uh, I understand that the Justice Department has withheld that memo in litigation. Uh, they have claimed privilege over that memo. And so 
uh, it would not be my place uh, to be able to describe that to you. You give me something to think about. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I, I wish that I could describe it. Um, however, it is, it is privileged. The Justice Department has claimed privilege over it, and so uh, it is my ethical obligation not to disclose that or any other advice uh, given to the Justice Department. Right. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Yeah. Chairman. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> First, I want to commend you and your leadership in handling the confirmation Sorry. process. Sorry. I'm personally baffled that the criticism for including more than one appeals court nominee yeah. in this hearing. This, co this committee has had eight chairmen, four Democrats, and four Republicans. And during my nearly 41 years here, uh, every one of them, including me, held multiple hearings with multiple appeals court nominees. In fact, by my count, there have been nearly 50 such hearings, more under Democratic chairman than under Republican chairman. The nominees here today are ready for a hearing, and you're holding this hearing, and that's a good thing. That's the chairman's job. You're handling it well with your usual fairness and openness, and I appreciate that. commend you for that. Now, Ms. Barrett, uh, let me just ask this question. Professor Barrett, some say that a judge must decide each case based on an impartial interpretation and application of the law. In other words, following the right process makes the results legitimate. Others say that a judge may decide cases based on her personal views <coughs> or with an eye toward achieving certain results. In other words, the ends justify the means. One left-wing group issued a report about your nomination which states, quote, stunningly, Barrett has asserted that judges should not follow the law or the Constitution when it conflicts with their personal religious beliefs, unquote. Now, is that true? That is not true, Senator Hatch. I have never said that. This group based its claim on an article you co-authored in 1998. That article considered a federal judge who is morally opposed to capital punishment presiding over a death penalty case. According to your critics, you believe that in such a conflict, the judge's personal views win. As I read the article, however, you believe the opposite, that in that situation, the law wins and the judge should recuse herself. Who's right? I believe that the law wins, and if there was ever, this is the ethical obligation imposed by the federal recusal laws, if a judge ever felt that for any reason that she could not apply the law, her obligation is to recuse. I totally reject, and I have rejected throughout my entire career, the proposition that, as you say, the end justifies the means, or that a judge should decide cases based on a desire to reach a certain outcome. Another important uh, element of a nominee's judicial philosophy is whether or how courts should follow their prior decisions or precedents. Of course, this is called the doctrine of stare decisis. And the issue is important for federal judges who deal with written law, such as statutes and the Constitution. That same left-wing group also said this about you in its report. Quote, moreover, Barrett has said that judges should not be bound by stare decisis, unquote. Is that true? I have not said that judges should not be bound by stare decisis. Senator Hatch, the, the bulk of my writing about stare decisis has been to emphasize its benefits to the system, um, and I have not said that judges ought not observe it. Well, thank you. I think that's how I re read your record, too. Uh, I think it really hurts a group's uh, credibility when... It so seriously distorts a nominee's clear record, which they have done. In your case, this misinformation is so blatant that it almost looks like, well, it looks deliberate. It's also disturbing when groups appear to suggest that someone who, like you do, takes her faith seriously and cannot be an impartial judge. This would not be the first time that outside groups or senators have objected to a nominee's religious views uh, they must not have read the Constitution, which prohibits a religious test for public uh, office. Please respond to that notion that a real commitment to religious faith is at odds with your impartiality as a judge. 
Senator, I see no conflict between having a sincerely held faith and duties as a judge. In fact, we have many judges, both state and federal across the country, who have sincerely held religious views and still impartially and honestly discharge their obligations as a judge. And were I confirmed um, as a judge, I would decide cases according to the rule of law beginning to end and in the rare circumstance that might ever arise. I can't imagine one sitting here now where I felt that I had some um, conscientious objection to the law, I would recuse. I would never impose my own personal convictions upon the law. Well, thank you. Uh, Justice Larson, the left-wing group that so seriously mischaracterized uh, Professor Barrett's views has done the same for you. Uh, they say a 2006 op-ed shows your belief that a president could ignore a law enacted by Congress simply because it th he thinks it would prevent him from governing as he, he, as he sees fit. But they left something out. You also wrote in that op-ed that if the president may ignore the will of Congress, quote, it is for one reason alone, because the Constitution so commands, unquote. It looks to me like your critics attribute to you a view that you expressly rejected. Is that right? Uh, I would agree with that statement, Senator Hatch. That is the statement that my critics um, uh, misattributed uh, my quote. May the president ignore, ignore a statute just because he uh, wants to do so? Absolutely not. In recent years, an important issue related to a nominee's judicial philosophy is whether judges may use for uh, a, a foreign law to interpret domestic uh, laws such as the Constitution. In one article, you distinguish between empirical and substantive uses of international law, saying that the former can be appropriate, but the latter would be revolutionary. Could you please explain this distinction? Sure. So when I was talking about the various uses uh, that courts might make of foreign or international law, uh, one thing I thought was that uh, sometimes constitutional doctrines requires us to have real-world answers, to, to know how a particular law will play out. And that, that is baked into the doctrine. Um, and sometimes the only place that might have experimented with the particular question at issue might not be a domestic source. So, for example, in the case of Washington versus Glucksburg, the Supreme Court looked to the practices of Netherland not to determine whether or not our law should follow Netherlands, but to figure out whether or not uh, a particular result would uh, ensue because that was required by the constitutional doctrine. Mr. Chairman, could I ask just one other yeah, question? Go ahead. I'd appreciate that. I want the record to reflect that each of these highly qualified nominees is supported by a long list of prominent lawyers from both sides of the aisle across the ideological spectrum and throughout the legal profession. I think that's really, really complimentary to both of you. Thank you. Uh, anybody who respects the law would respect each of you. Senator... I, I've been very, 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 very... Uh, sorry, Mr. Chairman. I've been very, very impressed with both of you. I think it's a great, it's a great privilege to serve on the federal courts. A great privilege to serve uh, anywhere in the federal system, but... All I can say is that I just want to personally congratulate both of you for the tremendous way you've approached the laws and for the intelligence that each of you has, uh, which is uh, really, uh, really terrific. So thank you so much for being willing to serve. Senator Coons. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Justice Larson, I wanted to just ask you if I could two questions about habeas and about right to privacy and some of your writings on it so I can better understand your views. Um, in a 2004 article you wrote, and I think I'm quoting here, it'd be an understatement in, a, in the extreme to call the Supreme Court's decision in Lawrence v. Texas revolutionary. The court, overruling a precedent only 17 years old, held the Constitution forbid states from criminalizing homosexual sodomy, close quote. Um, do you believe the court was wrong to overrule the Texas law at issue in Lawrence, which made same-sex intimacy a crime? And in your view, um, does the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment contain a right to privacy? Um, thank you for the question, Senator Kuntz. Um, as to the first, uh, I would say two things. One, um, that Law Review article uh, expressly declined to take a view on the merits. That was 
the opening paragraph just to describe here's what they did. Uh, and then the next paragraph begins by saying, the merits aside, and then went on for 100 pages to talk about not the merits of Lawrence versus Texas. Um, so that would be the first thing. The second thing I would say was, with respect to any precedent of the US Supreme Court, uh, I think it has been the position of nominees uh, be appearing before this body not to take a position on whether they were rightly or wrongly decided. Uh, and that is because all circuit court nominees, and in my current position as a justice of the Michigan Supreme Court, are bound by the Supreme Court's pronouncements. Uh, and I would never want a litigant in my court, in my current court, even to think uh, that I might not fairly follow the precedents of the US Supreme Court, because I absolutely will. Um, your second question, I think, was, uh, is there a Does, right to privacy in the Is there a right to privacy embedded? Is the substantive due process analysis um, that has led to the establishment in a series of affirmed um, Supreme Court opinions uh, correct? Well, uh, again, Senator, I don't think it would be appropriate for me to comment on whether the decisions of the U.S. Supreme Court are right or wrong. But you are absolutely right to note that uh, since Griswold versus Connecticut, the Supreme Court has recognized a right to privacy. Um, that has been more than 40 years. I couldn't tell you the exact date of Griswold. I apologize. Um, Madam Justice, let me move forward if I could. We have a, just a few minutes. Um, the other point I was getting to was just that Obergefell um, and Lawrence um, move beyond the privacy analysis on which Griswold and Roe rest and um, inserted a different analysis. But why don't I, one last question for you, if I might, that I think follows up somewhat on a previous question. Um, you wrote an article commenting on the signing statement that mm -hmm. accompanied the Detainee Treatment Act of 2005, which outlawed, outlawed torture. Um, help me understand um, your view about whether it would be legal for the president um, to violate that act in order uh, to engage in torture in order to protect the nation or pursue a higher calling. Sure. So um, that uh, op-ed was uh, not meant to comment on that particular signing statement, um, but rather to talk about signing statements in general. Um, but as to that particular signing statement or any signing statement, if any case were to come before my court that would present that question, uh, what I would do is I would evaluate that under Justice Jackson's three-part typology in the steel seizure case. Right. And in such a case, uh, we would be in box three, which is the lowest level, which would say that the president's powers were at his nadir. Um, and I don't believe there is a precedent of the US Supreme Court uh, that says that the president has ever survived a box three challenge. So that's how I would evaluate it. Thank you, Justice. If I might, Professor Barrett, first. Um, thank you uh, for introducing your remarkable family. Um, I, too, at times struggle to raise three children uh, effectively <laughs> and well and faithfully and that you have handled so um, admirably a much larger family um, really moved me. Um, I also have a 16-year-old daughter. And, um, your daughters are remarkably well-behaved today, so thank you um, for being <laughs> you, so girls. good while, you're, uh, while your mom is up here in front of all of us. Um, on habeas corpus, uh, I just want to ask you about a recent piece that you wrote for the National Constitution Center. Um, it stood out to me because habeas rights uh, protect against improper restrictions on liberty and provide access to federal courts. And I think I quote here, um, you said, because habeas was not a tool for obtaining post-conviction relief at the time the Constitution was ratified, the founding generation could not have understood the clause to protect this use of the writ. Isn't it true that eliminating access to federal habeas for post-conviction relief uh, might block ineffective assistance of counsel claims or claims based on actual innocence, and does that concern you? Yes, yeah, so Senator, you're, I think, referring to a, a short piece from the National Constitution Society uh, Constitution Project in which Neil Katyal and I wrote a back and forth, yes, where we identified current issues in the suspension clause and controversies. And the post-conviction portion, as I recall, of that essay was fairly brief. And I think, I think just the point that um, I was making and that um, Professor Katyal responded to was just we had devoted the bulk of that essay to focusing on the question of Congress's power to suspend the clause in the context of executive detention. Right. And so I simply observed that 
their core office of the writ, and the Supreme Court has also recognized that the core office of the writ is protection against executive detention, that in the context of post-conviction detention, that the court has um, suggested that since it's not the core office, that there might be more room to move in the suspension clause, but the court has rejected the possibility um, so far. I mean, the court's precedent is that Congress cannot fully withdraw that, and that essay was not meant to take on that challenge. Um, so let me just last, since I have one minute. <laughs> um, you've also written that the Supreme Court was wrong in Boumediene when it held Guantanamo detainees uh, must have access to habeas. Um, have you changed your view? Am I misunderstanding or mischaracterizing your view? Um, and do you think Congress could prevent detainees at Guantanamo from accessing courts, or federal courts, forgive me? Um, well, in the portion of that essay where I addressed that question, what I said was that the history of the suspension clause and the precedent, um, Johnson versus Eisentrager, mm -hmm. had cut against the majority's position, that the majority's position was driven by other concerns, you know, prudential concerns. Um, so I did indicate more agreement with the dissent's analysis of that constitutional question than the majority's. I will say that as an academic, um, analyzing an opinion outside of the process of actually deciding a case and reading the briefs is a far more general enterprise. It's a more of a bird's eye enterprise. And so I couldn't say with respect to that issue or any other that I would decide the case the same way as a judge. The role of an academic um, is very different. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Senator Kennedy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, professor, uh, I'm going to call you judge instead of that, that, Justice. That is uh, okay. perfectly, perfectly okay. I, I aspire to the office of judge if I'm so lucky. <laughs> in a, a long time ago, in a galaxy far away, I used to practice law. And uh, I appeared in federal court a lot. And the impression that I always came away from federal court with was the breathtaking power of a federal judge, appointed for life. Um, I'm pleased to say that, that, that most presidents um, get it right. Every now and then, I think presidents, through no fault of their own, have made mistakes, but they're few and far between. Um, I realized back when I was practicing law that one of the most important jobs of a United States senator never imagined then I'd be in the United States Senate, was the advice and consent part. Uh, we have to make sure that uh, a, a well-intentioned president isn't making a mistake. Now, it's been suggested to me by some people that uh, I and others should not ask hard questions of nominees by presidents of my own party. And I appreciate that advice, but I don't intend to follow. And my response to those who made that suggestion was, look, this is America. You can believe what you want. And if you feel really strongly about it, come on down to Louisiana and beat me for the U.S. Senate. But until then, I'm going to ask the questions I want to ask. Now, I understand you're, you're both smart. I, I mean, you wouldn't be here if you weren't. Your, your resume is just extraordinarily impressive. And I get it that you, I'll stipulate for the record that you're going to both follow precedent in every single case. In fact, if you came here and testified that you wouldn't, then you're not smart enough to be a federal judge. Okay? So I get that part. What, I'm trying, what I want to understand is what you think about the law. I mean, you both look at the law critically. You've both taught before. What, what, what did you teach, Judge? Uh, or I, maybe you still do. Uh, I taught constitutional law, criminal procedure, a course on statutory interpretation, um, and various other things when they needed me to do it. Okay. What did you teach, Professor? Or do you teach? Um, I, I do teach. Um, I teach civil procedure, I teach evidence, I teach constitutional law, the structural portion of the class, I teach federal courts, I teach statutory interpretation. Okay, let me ask you both a question then. Do you believe there are unenumerated rights in the United States Constitution? 
Um, Senator, the Supreme Court has long held that there are unenumerated rights in the Constitution. I, I know that. I'm asking you what you believe. Well, Senator, I feel compelled. I do welcome your hard questions. I'm glad. You know, I, I think that's part of this process. Um, I, I do think, though, that the line that other nominees have heeded in this case is a prudent one, not because I don't want to answer your questions or be cooperative. I want to cooperate as fully as I can. But I think if I express a personal view on any of these matters, it might give the misimpression that my personal view is what would drive the decision of a case. No, I, it I'll would not be. I stipulate that that won't happen. I believe you. <laughs> do you. Do you think? Do you think there's a right to privacy in the Constitution? I mean, when Griswold came down and you read it, what did you think? Did you say this is a well-reasoned opinion, and I and I agree with it. Of course you said you're going to follow it. We all follow the law. If you don't follow the law, you go to jail, okay? We, I'll stipulate that too. But what did you think about the opinion? I wasn't alive when Griswold came down. <laughs> well, what about when you first read it? Um, uh, well, well, gosh, Senator, I think, again, whatever I might have thought about it, I, I first read it when I was a law student, uh -huh. but whatever I would have thought about it then or whatever I would think about it today wouldn't matter. I would put that aside in the application of that. Okay, I'm going to move on. I'm not going to... I, I, I get it. I, I, I don't agree with the position you're taking where you don't want to talk to me about the law, but if that's what you're going to want to do, that's your call. It's America. It's a free country. Uh, Justice, Judge, do you believe in, in substantive due process? Um, the Supreme Court of the United States has plainly articulated that substantive due process is a part of our Constitution. And I would follow that. Okay. All right. Tell me about the, your, your thoughts about the adequate and independent state ground doctrine. I, I'm sorry. The, I, I don't, I'm sorry I didn't understand the question. Tell me about your thoughts about the adequate and independent oh, adequate. state grounds doctrine. Um, well, the adequate and independent state grounds doctrine is a doctrine articulated by the Supreme Court of the United States. Uh, and if any case came before me that called on uh, me to apply that doctrine, I would apply that doctrine. Okay. Have either of you ever read an opinion in your entire lives that you looked at and said, I don't quite agree with that? Surely I have. Okay. Which ones? Well, <laughs> so... Senator, um, I am being asked, uh, I currently sit on the Michigan Supreme Court, and uh, I am here uh, seeking a nomination to the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals. In both of those roles, it is incredibly important that people who appear before my court would understand that I would apply the precedent faithfully. And if you heard a judge say, wow, that's a really terrible precedent, I think you might question whether or not the judge would apply that precedent faithfully, especially if it's your best case. Imagine you're, this is your one and only case. So um, respectfully, I, I don't think it's appropriate for me to comment. Well, but you see what concerns me is, I, I know you both say you'll follow the law, and I believe you, but you're human. And, and, and it bothers me when, when uh, nominees will not come before this committee and, and allow us to have a good faith discussion of the law and the, the reasoning and the analysis. The law's not perfect. There have been opinions handed down that have been reversed. You, you're not robots. You don't have artificial intelligence. You have real intelligence. And you're going to be expected to use it. And, and I really regret that we can't have a full due process. I understand you want to be confirmed. I get that part. I'm over, Mr. Chairman. I'm sorry. Senator Arono. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Welcome to both of you and your families. I'll start with you, Ms. Barrett. You wrote about the duties of Catholic judges in capital cases and that the Catholic judge uh, should recuse themselves. Today, you testify that it is never proper for judges to put their personal views and I would assume their views about um, um, uh, death penalty cases, for judges to put their personal views above the law. Is that correct? Yes. You also testified today that you would not recuse yourself from any case on the grounds of conscience. 
Well, no, Senator, let me just clarify. What I said is that in all cases, I would fully and faithfully apply the law of recusal. And so I don't think I could or that any nominee or judge could say at the beginning, I'm never going to recuse, because that itself would violate the judge's ethical obligation to always be alert to that possibility. What oh. I said was that I could not imagine sitting here any class of cases or category of cases on which I would feel obliged to recuse on grounds of conscience. So in spite of the fact that you had written in an earlier article that Catholic judges, and you would be a Catholic judge, uh, you would not recuse yourself from death penalty cases. Senator Hirono, the article addressed a very narrow question. It actually addressed the obligation or, or how a conscientious subjector to the death penalty who was a trial judge would proceed if the law required that judge to enter the order of execution. Um, it did not address even the obligations. We didn't draw any conclusions about um, how an appellate judge who was in a conscientious objector should behave. And in fact, when I was a law clerk to Justice Scalia, I routinely participated in capital cases, and there were many of them. Well, then let me pose uh, the question, then if you were uh, not up for a circuit court, but in for a district court, would you recuse yourself as a Catholic judge from death penalty cases? Um, the article, it's a extremely, it was a complex question, and it took us almost 50 pages to analyze it, lots of research and lots of thought. The article did not argue that district judges had to um, recuse altogether in capital cases from every phase, but I would say that I would, if I were be being considered for a trial court, I would recuse myself and not actually enter the order of execution. That was the only conclusion the article reached, and I would stand by that today. So that, that's a pretty astounding conclusion uh, in my view. So um, what you testified to today is at odds, in my view, uh, from you had, what you had earlier written, and especially with regard to the role of religion uh, in, uh, particularly for Catholic judges. So would you agree that y your views have changed from your earlier writings? Um, Senator Hohn, I'm not sure that I track that question. The law itself in 28 U.S.C. 455 provides the outlet of recusal if there's ever a circumstance like the one we identified in that article. Ms. Barrett, I think your article is very plain in your uh, perspective about the role of religion uh, for judges, and particularly with regard to Catholic judges, and of course not all judges are Catholic, so um, we could go down the path of what you, believe, what you think would be the role of religion in, uh, for judges who are not Catholic, but be that as it may, it seems to me that your testimony today is at variance, is at variance with your earlier writings. And so I would draw that conclusion. I think that you were asked a series of questions uh, to, to uh, give you a chance to uh, clarify your earlier views, and I believe that you did. So I do not want to engage in, a, in a, you know, your further clarifications. I, I draw the conclusion that your views have changed. And if your views haven't changed, then I would say your article stands for itself. Your earlier writings. Well, Senator, what I said to Chairman Grassley in the beginning is that I did write that article as a student 20 years ago, and then I would not say that the article in all of its particulars represents my view um, today, that with 20 years of life experience, I would, and speaking in my own voice, would describe things a little bit differently now. But what I said to the chairman and is and what I'm saying to you now is that I continue to subscribe to the core argument of that article, which is that a judge may never subvert the law or twist it in any way to match the judge's convictions from whatever source they derive. And that was what that article repeatedly said, and it's a position to which I adhere before you now, under oath. Well, it was a 50-page article, as you say, and uh, people, other people can draw other conclusions. So uh, it was uh, enough of a statement of what you believe the role of religion was that it certainly caught uh, um, my attention because uh, I thought the, that justice was supposed to be blind. So... Um, Let's say that you did, you know, as you say, you acknowledge that in all of its particulars that you have changed your, your views about some of the things that you wrote in the article. And I, I, I hope that you can maybe very briefly, because I'm running out of time and I do have other questions for you, um, maybe you can just submit for the record then what other parts of the article that, that you no longer subscribe to. That would help me. Let me go on to my next question. 
You were asked some questions about the, the article that you wrote relating to super precedents, and you made it very plain that that was not your list. But did you agree with that list of super precedent decisions? Well, Senator, let me first say, as I said earlier in response, that from the perspective of a court of appeals judge, all precedent is super precedent. On that list of super precedents, um, again, I was using a list by other very well respected scholars. Well, my question scholars. is, I realize that. I'm sorry, I'm running out of time. So did you agree with that list, even if it was not a list that you had compiled? According to the definition of super precedent employed by those scholars, yes. If you use a different definition of super precedent, for example, a precedent that's more than 40 years old and that it survived multiple challenges, then I would include Roe on that list. It wasn't the definition. You would include, did you say you would include Roe on that list of super precedents? If super precedent were defined differently. Super precedent is used differently in different contexts. And in the particular context in which I was writing, um, the particular definition that was used, it did not satisfy that definition. What I'm saying is that if you use a different definition mm -hmm. of super precedent, which some people do, I think Roe could satisfy a different definition. I would also point out in language that I quoted from these other scholars that Professor Fallon at Harvard specifically said that the exclusion of Roe or any other case from the list does not mean that it should be overruled. But again, for a court of appeals judge, that's kind of beside the point because all precedent is super precedent when it comes from the Supreme when, Court. When it comes from the, but in your view, it should, based on a different definition of what a super precedent should be, would you, uh, the, the definition that you cite of 40 years um, survive multiple challenges, do you think that role should be in that list of super precedents? Plainly, according to that definition. Thank you. Certainly. Mr. Chairman, I'm out of time, but I do have some other questions that I'd like to submit for the record okay. for both of our nominees. Senator Lee. Uh, thank you very much, and thank you for being willing to be considered for these nominations and for bringing your families along. As one of seven children, I, I, I know what each of you probably experiences. You've probably at times been called by your siblings' names, uh, uh, e even in a, in, a, in a family of two. And I have a daughter named Eliza, by the way. Uh, that probably happens from time to time. I'd like to start by addressing a topic raised by one of my colleagues a few minutes ago and talk a little bit about why it is that it's often not appropriate for a judicial nominee to speak about his or her opinion about a particular canonical precedent. Um, so I could ask the question, a long line of questions. Do you agree with uh, Marbury v. Madison? Do you agree with McCulloch v. Maryland? Do you agree with Gibbons v. Ogden? And your reaction to that would, I assume, be the same as it was to the previous line of questions raised by my colleague. Is, is that correct? Yes, Senator Lee. Would you agree with that, Justice Larson? Absolutely. Um, and, and the fact is that this is not about being able to talk about Supreme Court opinions. The, the point here is that there are certain cases that are, form part of the canon of our legal system. And those cases are, are not up for debate. Those cases are not uh, appropriately debated by uh, members of our judiciary. Uh, when a case comes up, you're expected to rule on the basis of the law and the facts before you in that particular case. And to the extent the case we're talking about forms part of the canon of the law that you're required to apply, it will have been inappropriate and unfair to the litigants appearing before you for you have to have expressed a personal opinion uh, on that particular line of cases. So uh, uh, with respect to my colleague, I do not believe, and I, and I strongly dis disagree with the characterization that it is in any way, shape, or form inappropriate for you to, to not answer that question. Uh, Ms. Barrett, I, I want to start with you on a couple of questions. Uh, some of my colleagues have asked you a few questions about stare decisis based on uh, the, uh, one of your academic pieces that we've discussed earlier in this hearing. Um, everyone tends to talk about stare decisis from an institutional perspective, as you correctly uh, uh, point out in your piece. But you take the, the somewhat different approach of considering stare decisis from the perspective of individual rights. In other words, when a court is following the doctrine of stare decisis, the court is effectively foreclosing the right of an individual litigant to raise effectively or with any hope of being effective in raising a particular argument before the court. Is, is that an accurate characterization? Of the stare decisis and due yes. process article, yes, um, Senator Lee. And so in that respect, it's an imposition on individual liberty, on uh, the ability of an individual uh, 
uh, party to a, a piece of litigation or to a criminal matter to raise certain arguments. Yes, yes. Now, um, I, I'd also uh, like to address uh, uh, the following point. D during Justice Kagan's confirmation hearing, uh, she was asked about a bench memo that she wrote while serving as a law clerk uh, on the Supreme Court of the United States to Justice Thurgood Marshall. In that memo, uh, she had written, quite, uh, quote, quite honestly, I think that although the lower court's decision is well-intentioned, parts of it are ludicrous, she went on to recommend that Justice Marshall vote against certiorari because other justices, quote, might create some very bad law on abortion and or prisoners' rights, close quote. She was asked about that, asked about her, her feelings about that, and, and here's how she responded, quote, when I was clerking for Justice Marshall, I was 27 years old, and Justice Marshall was an 80-year-old icon, uh, a lion of the law. He had firm views. He had strong views. He knew that he thought about a great many legal questions. He had been a judge for some fair amount of time, close quote. The committee accepted that answer and uh, uh, went on uh, recognizing this fact that Justice, and now Justice Kagan's views uh, in her 20s would not necessarily uh, be the same views uh, that she might take today. Uh, do you think that's a fair way of approaching that? I do, Senator Lee. Um, Justice Larson, um, after Justice Scalia's death, uh, I, I, I was pleased with your fitting tribute to your former boss, uh, Justice Scalia, and the, 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 the piece that you wrote uh, appropriately described the relationship between a law clerk and a jurist as an almost familial one. Uh, and it's, it's disappointing, but I suppose not entirely surprising, that some have criticized you uh, for your association with Justice Scalia and for your praise of him. But I was, I was particularly struck by the following passage uh, when you write, quote, Justice Scalia wanted to get things right, and therefore he valued clerks who would argue with them about why his initial thinking might be wrong. If you could prove your case, you could win him over. But it could not be done with appeals to emotion or outcome or legacy or anything else. The only way was to convince him, uh, uh, to convince him, was to show him that the law was on the other side, usually by peeking nervously over his shoulder as he read and questioned and then reread cases. My proudest moment as his law clerk was convincing him, with two sleepless nights of research into dusty old precedents, that a criminal defendant should win in a case that none of the justices originally thought he should win, close quote. So, Justice Larson, uh, what can you tell us about uh, how Justice Scalia's jurisprudence uh, uh, helped shape your approach to the law, and what did your clerkship teach you about the humility that a good judge should have? Uh, thank you so much uh, for that question, Senator Lee. Um, Justice Scalia, uh, as... Uh, as you noted uh, in the remarks I made, uh, believed in following the law where the law led him. Uh, he never worked the other way around. That is, find the result that you'd like and then find the precedence to fit it. The this one simple and clear rule that he taught us was that the law governs, not personal interest, not personal outcome, not personal preference. Um, he also taught us to be very careful uh, in reading the cases, in reading the statutes. Uh, he taught us to debate. He taught us that um, what I hope I am trying to teach my law clerks is that um, engagement with ideas that might not initially seem appropriate to the judge can often lead the judge uh, to change her mind um, and to get the right result. And that is my most important job as a justice of the Michigan Supreme Court, and uh, if I am lucky enough to be confirmed uh, to the Sixth Circuit. Thank you very much. Senator Durbin. Thank you very much. Uh, Professor Barrett, many questions that have been asked of you relate to your uh, religious belief, and uh, I, I, it is relevant in that you have many times spoken out as a professor uh, and um, as a, a lawyer about the burden and opportunity presented by your faith. This article of 20 years ago, which you wrote with John Garvey, uh, as I understand it, you now say you don't agree with. Is that correct? 
No, Senator Durbin, I agree with the article's main point, as I said, which is that any kind of conviction, religious or otherwise, should never surpass the law. Um, a judge can never follow um, or impose that judge's personal conviction upon litigants in the decision of cases. And that was the article's main point, and I agree with it. Would I, sitting here today, write that article the same way or say that it's an exact mirror image of how I would feel now, 20 years older? No. I mean, but it, the thrust of it, that that core point, which restates 28 U.S.C. 455's ethical obligation, I obviously, as every judge would, adhere to. So let me ask you this question. I'm a product of 19 years of Catholic education, mm -hmm. and every once in a while, Holy Mother of the Church has not agreed with a vote of mine, uh, and has let me know. You use a term in that article, or you both use a term in that article I'd never seen before. You refer to Orthodox Catholics. What's an Orthodox Catholic? Um, as I recall, that term, um, we said something like, for lack of a better term, we're using the term Orthodox Catholic, and there was a long footnote saying, you know, that that was an imperfect term. Uh, it could, you know, refer to Orthodox Judaism, you know, Greek Orthodox. And so we kind of cast about, but what that term was designed to capture, because we were talking about conscientious objection, was a judge who... Um, accepted the church's teaching that the death penalty would be impermissible in that case. We wrote about it from the perspective of a Catholic judge because my professor, John Garvey, had already undertaken that project, but it's really a problem that could face a judge of any religion or no religion at all who had a conscientious objection to the death penalty. Do you consider yourself an Orthodox Catholic? I am a Catholic, Senator Durbin. I, I don't, well, Orthodox Catholic, we kind of, as I said, in that article, we just kind of use that as a proxy. It is not, to my knowledge, you know, a term currently in use, but if you're asking whether I take my faith seriously and I'm a faithful Catholic, I am, although I would stress that my personal church affiliation or my religious belief would not bear on the discharge of my duties as a judge. There are many um, people who might characterize themselves as Orthodox Catholics who now question whether Pope Francis is an Orthodox Catholic. I happen to think he's a pretty good Catholic. I agree with you. Good. Then that's good common ground for us to start with. It's interesting that both of you have clerked for Judge Scalia, and he has become a, a, quite a presence in this hearing and the questions that we've asked. Another teaching of the church relates to same-sex marriage. In the Obergefell decision, uh, Justice Scalia was very outspoken and criticizing and dissenting in, in only, as only Justice Scalia could from that decision. So tell me how you view that, uh, the whole issue of same-sex marriage, your Catholic belief, and what it means to you on the bench if a case comes before you that raises this Obergefell precedent. Well, Senator Durbin, in the context of same-sex marriage, as in the, any context, my religious beliefs really would not bear on that at all. I mean, beginning to end, in every case, my obligation as a judge would be to apply the rule of law. In the case that you mentioned, would be applying Obergefell, and I would have no problem adhering to it. I mean, I think one of the great traditions in this country is that judges participate in the law um, participate in the decision of cases and rule even when they disagree with the outcome. And I think. Actually, when they, especially when they disagree with outcome, think of a judge who knows a defendant to be guilty because of suppressed evidence. Um, but that judge will still fairly ensure the rights of every litigant, which is why I think, you know, I, why I keep saying again and again that any personal view would be irrelevant to that because... I understand that. And I, I listened carefully to Senator Lee and others, uh, and I've, I can't tell you how many nominees have been before us in this panel for the, for the bench, and virtually all say the same. I'm following the precedent, I'm following the law, I'm following the Constitution. Don't worry a thing about who I am, how I was raised, what my religion is, what my life experiences have been. Put it all aside. I don't believe that for a second. I don't think cases reach your level, at circuit level, that are that clear. Maybe some are, but few. You're really called on to judge cases that are a close call. And some of them involve interpretations of what did that word mean in that Supreme Court decision? What did that word mean in the law? What was Congress trying to do? And I don't think you can divorce yourself from life's reality at that point. Uh, I am going to see things in a certain way based on what I've done, what I've seen, what I believe uh, in my life. Uh, and I'm going to call it the appropriate interpretation of the law. So I don't buy this 
robot approach that it's just so easy. You push the law and the facts on one side and the opinion comes out the other side. Otherwise, every opinion would be a majority or a unanimous decision, and that isn't often the case. I do want to ask you about one thing, and I just have a minute and a half left here. Um, the worst vote I ever cast in the House or Senate was one in a panic over the appearance of crack cocaine. The belief was that crack cocaine was cheap, it was easily accessible, it was devastating, particularly to pregnant women, and we needed to do something about it and do it damn fast, and we did. We imposed a penalty on crack cocaine of 100 to 1 over powder campaign, crack cocaine. 100 to 1. The net result of that was devastating, particularly to African Americans. They were incarcerated in numbers unheard of uh, previously. And many of us came to realize what a terrible mistake we had made. And we came up with a conclusion, or at least a solution, I think, or at least a response. Durbin and Sessions, go figure, came up with a compromise to bring it down to 18 to 1. I wanted 1 to 1, he wanted something higher, that's what happens in, in, in Congress. And then the Sentencing Commission said, well, if 100 to 1 was so bad and we're down to 18 to 1, we at least owe the people currently incarcerated the right to have an individual review as to whether or not they're going to stay in prison. You wrote an article critical of that. Tell me why. Senator, that was a short blog post, and I did not intend, I, I, I didn't comment on the crack cocaine disparity. Um, that blog post simply raised the practical questions. My husband is an assistant United States attorney, and this had been table talk at home, how the system was going to process um, that many retroactive claims. And so, as I recall, that was just a short blog post, and it actually solicited input from others and said, you know, does anybody know, I think this was the first time the Sentencing Commission had made a guideline retroactive, and it just said, well, gosh, this is going to, you know, be an administrative issue, and does anyone know how these kinds of things would be handled? Well, I hope that's all it was, because I think there was a gross miscarriage of justice, and unfortunately, I was party to it, along with the members, a lot of members of Congress in both political parties, and I think the commission, on a bipartisan basis and a unanimous basis, did the right thing. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Senator Flake. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for appearing here. Thank you for bringing your families. Uh, it's, it's nice to see um, such support uh, from, from families. I'm one of 11 children, so I, I know I'm right in the middle. Uh, people often ask, and kids can uh, sympathize if I was ever longing for love or longing for affection. <laughs> and I always say, I know, I was just longing for food. <laughs> <laughs> I'd trade all the affection in the world for seconds on dessert just once in my life. So anyway, it's, it's nice to have you here. Professor Barrett, uh, let me begin by saying uh, something I told Justice uh, Gorsuch during the hearing, that I don't plan to ask you about your religion or how you practice your faith. Um, I don't, uh, I think to do so would unreasonably imply that we should administer some kind of religious test and that would undermine a crucial freedom that the Constitution safeguards. And so I appreciate the answers that you've given in this regard uh, over and over again. Is there anything you'd like to add that hasn't been said in that regard? No, Senator Flake. Thank you. Justice Larson, could you tell me a little about uh, your work on the veterans' drug courts? That's an issue that uh, I've been active with and affects my state. Oh, I would be delighted to. Um, and I don't know what sort of uh, activities have been taking place uh, with respect to the federal courts. But um, in Michigan, we are a leader in veterans courts. Uh, we also have uh, drug treatment courts, sobriety courts, and mental health courts. Uh, I am the Michigan Supreme Court's liaison to those courts. And my role is to uh, help support and facilitate the great work that is being done there. Um, often our servicemen and women come back uh, from serving our country and uh, they face problems related uh, either to post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, to alcoholism or drug dependency. And what our veterans courts do is they pair uh, someone who has run into trouble with the law with a mentor, often a veteran mentor. Um, they're put through a probationary process which uh, holds them accountable but also gets them the help they need. 
Um, I am very proud of the work uh, that I've been able to do uh, with respect to the veterans um, and with respect to our other treatment courts, which really are working um, and uh, saving lives and saving taxpayer money. We've seen that impact in Arizona as well. Uh, to, to go, and I went a while ago and witnessed that, that court in action and to see the various groups uh, that were there ready to help these veterans. Um, a number of, of, of outside groups and, and family members and friends who had been at, uh, through it before. And, and the, the, the judges, uh, certainly, who, had, who were familiar with the military experience. And, and so, anyway, I applaud you for that. And uh, how, how will that impact, or how has that impacted your view toward the law? Well, um, Senator, I, I don't, like I said, I don't know uh, what the federal courts have been doing with respect to those sorts of, um, those sorts of treatment courts, um, but I would be interested to find out because I think they've been a great success, at least in Michigan. Um, what I can say with respect to the law is uh, it always matters. Judges should always recognize that there are real people on both sides of the V. Um, I don't think that that means uh, that judges distort the law in order to reach a particular outcome. Um, but I do think that it means that judges need to make sure they are working very hard to get the right answer because the decisions that we render have real world consequences. Um, and so thinking about that, those experiences, when I get to go to a veterans court graduation or a drug court graduation, I get to see a family that gets put back together. Um, those are some of the happiest days uh, when I get to wear my current robe. Mm -hmm. um, and I hope uh, that if I'm given another robe, actually, I think in the federal system, you have to buy your own robe. So uh, I will buy my own robe uh, if, if I am so fortunate. And um, I hope that I'll get to have similar experiences on the federal court. Thank you. Professor Barrett, uh, I find it remarkable that you've received a groundswell of support, even uh, from fellow Supreme Court clerks uh, from both sides of the aisle. According to them, you, quote, are eminently qualified for the job. Uh, this view seems unanimous. Every law clerk uh, from the October team in 1998 has joined the letter. Uh, every one. Uh, these clerks are not alone in their endorsement. It also appears that every full-time colleague of yours uh, at Notre Dame Law School signed a letter supporting your nomination. Uh, we in the Senate know better than most that uh, it's tough to get a unanimous <laughs> decision. <laughs> Um, so that is impressive. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to submit two letters into the record. The first comes from Professor Barrett's uh, fellow Supreme Court clerks, and the second is from our Notre Dame uh, Law School colleagues. Without objection. Professor Barrett, in just the remaining time I have, what is your statutory or your approach to statutory interpretation? Under what circumstances, if any, should a judge look to legislative history in uh, con uh, construing a statute? Thank you, Senator Flake. Um, the Supreme Court all nine justices are clear that you begin with the text of the statute. And when the text of the statute is clear, that the text of the statute controls. That legislative history can sometimes provide helpful context, but when the text is clear, I would see as a judge no reason to consult it. All right. Thank you. Judge Larson, do you agree? Uh, yes, I do. All right. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Klobuchar. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you to both of you for appearing before us today. Um, I know, uh, Professor Barrett, that Senator Feinstein uh, discussed uh, this 2013 piece um, in, in relation to stare decisis, this article you wrote. Um, in that same piece, you also addressed the role of precedent in controversial areas of the law, stating that uh, in the world we live in, that level of stability is more than we have experienced or should expect in particular divisive areas of constitutional law. Uh, you noted that you tend to agree with those who say that a justice's duty is to the Constitution and that it is thus more legitimate for her to enforce her best understanding of the Constitution rather than a precedent she thinks clearly in conflict with it. So my question would be how important you think stability is in the law and balancing that constitutional view um, and precedent that you may not agree with. How, where do you see stability in the law factoring in? Thank you, Senator Klobuchar. I think stability is very important in the law. 
in that 2013 article in the Texas Law Review, I was defending the Supreme Court's own doctrine, which gives weaker stare decisis effect to constitutional cases. Um, the court has had that practice since Justice Brandeis wrote um, a separate opinion in Coronado um, oil and gas case, saying that constitutional cases should receive the least precedential effect compared to statutory or common law cases because the difficulty of amendment means that the Supreme Court's overruling of the case is often the only way to correct the error. And in the portion that you quoted where you said that I said I tend to agree with those, I was actually responding in that paragraph to the argument that it's never permissible, that the rule of stare decisis should be hard and fast. And I was quoting Justice Douglas has a famous piece about stare decisis where he was writing actually about his view of the living constitution, saying that if the constitution was to evolve, that sometimes that meant leaving precedents behind. And so all that that um, quote was, or that portion was designed to say is that the Supreme Court has never accepted, I'm not aware of any justice who has, the view that it's prima facie illegitimate to ever overrule precedent. You know, that the court's policy, it, it's, it's, its doctrine of stare decisis says that there are some circumstances in which overruling is warranted. Okay. Thank you for clarifying that. I appreciate it. Um, you've also written on methods of constitutional interpretation, including on the doctrine of originalism. Uh, last year, you co-authored a law review article titled Congressional Originalism that discussed the role of pragmatism and strategy and how originalists approach or try to overturn precedent. Um, the article asserted that the office holder has the discretion to decide when the timing is right to challenge a precedent with which uh, he or she disagrees. Um, I know that's particularly focused on Congress, but I wanted to ask if you believe the same concept applies to judges. And in other words, do you believe that an originalist justice on the Supreme Court should bide his or her time until there is an opportunity to overturn a particular precedent? Um, Senator, as you say, that particular article was focused on Congress, but in the earlier 2013 article in the Texas Law Review that you referred to, I did talk about um, judges and how that might play out there. And what I emphasized was that in addition to the strength of stare decisis, there are so many other mechanisms in the law that contribute to stability and that restrain judges from kind of roaming around and correcting precedents that they may not like or that they think are wrong, including the case or controversy requirement, the rule that judges only decide the question presented before them. And so that these and other mechanisms serve to restrain judges and prevent them from reaching out and trying to decide, aha, the time has come and I'm going to overrule this precedent. So no, on the contrary, in the judicial context, that Texas Law Review article makes clear that these um, rules that the court has imposed on itself, and, and I was focusing on the Supreme Court, contribute to stability and restrain ju the judge's hand. Okay, very good. Um, um, Justice Larson, I understand you've also commented on the doctrine of originalism, um, and I believe that some lines from Chief Justice Marshall's opinion in McCulloch v. Maryland, 1819, almost two centuries ago, are still relevant to that discussion. He wrote that the founders must have intended our Constitution, quote, to endure for ages to come and consequently to be adapted to the various crises of human affairs. Uh, he continued to say it would be unwise to provide by immutable rules for exigencies which, if foreseen at all, must have been seen dimly and what can be best provided for as they occur. Do you agree with that point that Justice Marshall made in McCulloch? Um, well, certainly, as uh, Justice Marshall made the point in McCulloch versus Maryland, I think he was talking about um, the Constitution's... Uh, needs to be a constitution that will endure um, and that can adapt, but I, it doesn't necessarily mean that I think um, that judges ought to be imposing their own views. Um, rather, uh, the constitution obviously can change. We changed from Plessy versus Ferguson to Brown versus the Board of Education, um, if that's what you mean. Mm -hmm. um, one other question. I know Senator Feinstein asked you about your work at um, the... Um, with the executive branch um, in the Justice Department's Office of Legal Counsel. So I just, I, I know she specifically asked about the torture issue, but I want to ask you about your views in general on how judges should consider national security matters uh, like the ones before the Justice Department. At that time when you were there, how do you believe courts should approach the balance between national security and civil individual rights? Well, that's an extremely broad 
question. Um, how should judges balance national security and civil rights? Is, yes, it's, a, it's my question. Yeah, yeah. It, I'm just trying to answer it uh, in a in a framework. Um, I think that the typically the right framework would be um, to look at the text of whatever statute Congress has passed in the area of either national security or the area of, of civil rights. Um, to look at the Constitution, obviously there might be a due process challenge to some claim uh, uh, against a statute uh, in the national security area to read the precedents um, that surround that, to listen carefully to the arguments of counsel, um, to consult with colleagues, to consult with clerks. Um, that's how I would approach a case. Uh, I, I don't know that I can do any better in the abstract uh, than to say that I would apply the law faithfully. Thank you. Professor Barrett. Um, can you explain for non-experts what the religious test clause is and why it's such an important structural feature of the Constitution? Um, the religious test clause, as I understand it, prohibits the imposition of any kind of religious test as a qualification for serving um, an office. And if we were to start ignoring this part of the Constitution, what sort of damage uh, would that present to the Republic if people with particular religious views were excluded from public life? Um, well, I, I think it could cause all kinds of harm, I mean, including infringements upon religious freedom. Thank you. I think some of the questioning that you've uh, been subjected to today uh, seems to miss some of these fundamental constitutional protections that we all have. Uh, Senator Blumenthal. Thank you, uh, Senator Sass. Uh, Justice Larson, um, and by the way, thank you both for your commitment to public service. Let me ask you, uh, you are aware, I'm sure, that you were listed twice on President Trump's uh, potential Supreme Court nominee list. President Trump has repeatedly suggested that he has a litmus test for Supreme Court nominees, including whether they are, quote, pro-life, end quote, and will, quote, automatically, end quote, overturn Roe v. Wade. Do you think that you have passed that litmus test? Um, Senator Blumenthal, I don't know how I got on President Trump's list. Um, it was a complete surprise to me. Um, and no one has ever asked me uh, about my opinion on any particular case. Um, if someone believes I've passed some litmus test, I, I honestly don't know how they came to that conclusion. Um, I would faithfully uphold the principles and the precedents of the Supreme Court of the United States, including Roe versus Wade, Casey, and its progeny. So if you were nominated to the court, you would vote to uphold Roe v. Wade? Well, um, Senator, I wouldn't want to make any commitment to an office for which I have not even is there been anything nominated. Record, is there anything in your record that would justify someone thinking that you would overturn Roe v. Wade? Not that I am aware of. Uh, do you think that it's appropriate for the president to have a litmus test of that kind for Supreme Court nominees? I wouldn't purport to comment on how the president of the United States uh, does his job with respect to nominations any more than I would purport to comment on how you would perform your advice and consent function. Well, you're welcome to comment on my performance. <laughs> People do it all the time, um, but <clears throat> probably are reluctant to do it in this setting. It, it seems like the better course. <laughs> <laughs> uh, M Professor Barrett, uh, in a speech that you delivered at Notre Dame in 2013, entitled Roe at 40, the Supreme Court abortion and the culture wars that followed, you suggested that overturning Roe would have little impact on Americans. You said, quote, the day after Roe fell, of course, abortion would be neither legal nor illegal throughout the United States. Instead, the states and Congress would be free to ban, protect, or regulate abortion as they saw fit. Do you continue to believe that? Um, Senator, the context of those remarks was addressing the, um, I, 
was addressing the pro-life movement. I'd been asked a question about protests of Roe versus Wade, and I was indicating that I thought that that was not, um, that for those students in the audience who were interested in protesting, I was simply saying, you know, for you, if, if that's what you're interested in, you know, I, I thought that it wasn't a fruitful course, a fr fruitful way for them to think about it. I wasn't commenting on the impact that um, Roe would have. Um, would, would you agree with me that overturning Roe, in fact, would have a massive, disruptive, hurtful effect on countless women who continue to rely on its protection? Senator, in Casey, the Supreme Court said just that. In Casey versus Pennsylvania, the court said that the reliance interests were great and that women had planned their lives around Roe versus Wade, and that was part of the ground for the Supreme Court's decision. I'm aware of what Casey said. I'm asking what your belief is about the effect of overturning Roe v. Wade. Would you agree with me that it would have a massive disruptive effect on the lives of countless Americans? Well, Senator, I don't think I ought to express personal opinions for the reason why um, nominees have drawn that, for the same reason that nominees have given in the past. I'm but not I do asking think you for your personal opinion about right or wrong. I'm asking you the same question, in effect, that you were apparently asked in 2013, and you said it would have no effect. Would you continue to say that now? Well, well, Senator, in the context, I think we're talking about it in a different context you're than it was. You're here in this context. I'm okay. asking the question in this context. In this what context, is if you're asking whether Roe would have, whether it would be disruptive to overrule Roe, I guess I would say again what the Supreme Court said in Casey, that if Roe were overturned, the court made very clear that there would be a disruptive effect to women's lives. The court also referred to the disruptive effect um, for the court's legitimacy. So and you the would, you of the would agree with the court in Casey that its effect would be disruptive? The court said in Casey that the effect would be disruptive. All Supreme Court precedent I'm going to agree with. If I'm on the Court of Appeals, I embrace it. And the court described it that way, and I embrace the court's precedent. Do you think Roe v. Wade was correctly decided? Well, Senator, I'm sorry that I feel like I can't, as a nominee, offer an opinion, um, as I said before, on the rightness or wrongness of any precedent, because I don't want to give the impression that I would treat some precedents as more binding or more valuable than others. I would apply Roe and its progeny just like I would apply all Supreme Court precedent. Do you believe there's a right to privacy under the Constitution? The Court has quite clearly held that there is. And do you agree with the Court? Senator Blumenthal, I would follow all court precedent, and whether I agree or disagree would be beside the point to the discharge of my duties if I were confirmed as a so judge. So you have no personal views on whether there's a right to privacy in the Constitution? Well, Senator, I think the question is whether I have personal views that would be appropriate to share in this context, given the misimpression it could give litigants who might appear before me if I were confirmed. Is there a First Amendment free expression right in the Constitution? The First Amendment quite explicitly protects the right to free speech. And is there a free expression right in the Constitution? Yes. I assumed that you were asking me about the right to privacy in the Due Process Clause, but of course the Constitution expressly protects privacy and the freedom of association and the Fourth Amendment protection against unreasonable searches and seizures, for example. And what about the right of a woman to determine when and whether she becomes pregnant? The court has held that while that right is not expressed in the due process clause, that it is implied. And the court has reiterated that. You know, it, Griswold was the foundation of Roe, and the court has adhered to that view for many, many years. And you would adhere stringently and faithfully to that precedent? I absolutely would, Senator Blumenthal. And you have no personal beliefs as to whether Roe was correctly decided? Well, Senator, it's not that I wouldn't have personal beliefs. I'm sure that every nominee before you has beliefs about that president and many other, precedent and many other, but all nominees are united in their belief that what they think about a precedent should not bear on how they would decide cases. Well, we hear that from a lot of nominees. And then, in all frankness, inevitably, personal beliefs enter into judicial decisions. Anybody who has practiced law, and I've done it for 40 years, knows that judges with the best of intentions, are often influenced by their personal decisions. Wouldn't you agree? 
Senator, I, I, I want you to, to know that you don't have to just take my assurance for it. As Senator Flake said, I've gotten bipartisan support in ways that I've found actually very moving. Um, all the law clerks, the term that I clerk, nine different justices, many different views, all my colleagues, 70 members, or more than 70 members, my academic colleagues, hundreds of Notre Dame alumni, people across the ideological spectrum. And if these people, especially people who disagree with me on policy matters, thought that I would be about the business of imposing my policy beliefs, I would not have received such bipartisan support. I've conducted myself as a professional my whole career and would continue to do so if I were confirmed. I am in no way impugning your professional integrity. Please don't misunderstand me. Uh, I know about your, the support for you. I'm just inquiring as to your beliefs, not personal beliefs, but your beliefs on a legal issue, whether Roe v. Wade was correctly decided. Senator, we need and to move to I know that Senator my time has expired, so I will yield. Thank you. Senator Whitehouse. Thank you very much, Chairman. Um, before I ask any questions, I just want to say something. I guess I've said it before, but the um, process here is just becoming increasingly preposterous. Um, I look out at a president who has specifically said he has litmus tests for his appointees specifically said that. And I look out at a very significant machinery of influence that is designed, that has as its purpose to bring the will of ideological and commercial interests into our courts in ways that will follow the wishes of those ideological and commercial interests. And then I see nominees who have the support of that president with his litmus tests and with his disregard for the rule of law, who've been cleared by those very ideological and commercial interests for policy-making positions in the courts. Policy-making enough that apparently this committee is considering no longer honoring blue slips on these. And then we get answers that are hopeless in terms of trying to give us any sense of what those effects will be. You know, Senator Blumenthal has argued in front of the Supreme Court multiple occasions. Before I got here, I used to practice appellate law more than any other kind. I was the attorney general and U.S. attorney for my state. I've argued in the Supreme Court. I've argued in the First Circuit over and over again. I've argued before our state Supreme Court. To sit here and pretend that there is no role for people's personal or private views or their social views when they go to the court is just, I mean, it's so preposterous as to be silly. And if that were true, then why would the Judicial Crisis Network, whose very job is to try to force that ideological and commercial set of interests onto the court, be spending hundreds of thousands of dollars in dark money on behalf of those interests to try to get people confirmed? Both can't be true. And we sit here in this bizarro world in which we're asked to pretend that nominees' personal views and social views have no role and we shouldn't discuss them at all, we're all just going to sit around following precedent, when we know as practicing lawyers that that is not true, and when we know as politicians that the entire machinery that is designed to screen and jam onto our courts nominees who have the right ideology and the right affinity for commercial interests is doing it foolishly with no possibility of return on its investment because all we're going to do is sit around following precedent. It just doesn't make sense. And the protocol for answering questions that has developed in this committee makes the committee look preposterous. It makes the witnesses, the nominees look preposterous. We have got to get beyond this if we're going to have meaningful hearings and not just 
verbal jousting and gamesmanship. It really is distressing to me that we go through such a procedure here right now and have this pretense that there aren't these massive forces at work to jam ideological and commercial views and interests and points of view onto our courts. We see over and over again nominees that can't say that dark money is a bad thing. Can't say that anonymous, unlimited spending in our democracy is a bad thing. Everybody on the street knows it's a bad thing. The Supreme Court walked away from it in Citizens United. Even the justices who signed off on that wretched decision walked away from at least the dark money part. We couldn't get Judge Gorsuch to say anything about it. Nobody will say anything about it. And at the same time, they also just happened to line up on being anti-choice and anti-gay rights. Now, show me the overlap where those two align logically from the point of view of principle. They just happen to almost always be pro-gun. They just happen to almost always be against environmental and safety protections that agencies enforce on behalf of the American public over and over and over again. And we're supposed to, like, ignore this pattern? It doesn't make any sense. These hearings are, I think, at some level, um, preposterous, to go back to my original word. And um, I don't know how you explain the support of the Digital Crisis Network, um, Ms. Larson. How on earth you can, on the one hand, be the voice of uh, disinterested neutrality and just going to follow precedent, and at the same time, you've got this dark money special interest group pounding away at the Michigan senators to try to get around the blue slip and get you confirmed. What do they think they're going to get for their investment in, in your candidacy for the court, Ms. Larson? Why would they be spending this money if they didn't see some return? Does it just make no sense at all? Is it a nonsensical effort by then? Well, Senator Whitehouse, um, I, do, I honestly don't know. Um, I will tell you, I did see that um, some group uh, ran a commercial. Uh, I learned about that commercial when I was in the gym uh, doing my best. I'm not best. suggesting that you wrote the commercial. I'm not suggesting that you approved the commercial. I'm suggesting that there are big political interests that are powerful enough to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars to try to influence public opinion in your favor. And my question is, what do they want for their return on investment? People don't usually throw that kind of money around for nothing. Well, Senator Whitehouse, I honestly have no idea. Um, if you look at my record on the Michigan Supreme Court, I think that if you look at it, you will see that in the votes I have cast over the two years, when there have been cases in which a corporation or an insurance company was on one side and an individual was on another, those cases have come out about 50-50. So if anybody thinks they are buying something in terms of commercial interests, um, I don't think my record bears that out. Well, we'll see if they keep spending the money because obviously they think so. It's just the strangest damn thing. My time has expired. Senator Franken. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Professor uh, Barrett, uh, on the financial disclosure report that you submitted to this committee, you listed two payments of $2,100 each from the Alliance Defending Freedom, or ADF. Uh, ADF, for those who are not familiar with it, is a uh, far-right group that files cases and lobbies for policies that ADF characterizes as defending religious liberty. But when you actually take a look at, uh, at ADF's work, it's clear that the group's real purpose is to advance an extreme version or vision of society. The Southern Poverty Law Center, which tracks hate groups, describes ADF as a group that has, quote, supported the recriminalization of homosexuality in the United States and criminalization abroad. 
criminalization of homosexuality, has defended state-sanctioned sterilization of transgender people abroad, has linked homosexuality to pedophilia, and claims that a homosexual agenda will destroy Christianity and society. In addition to the lawsuits it files, ADF also runs a training program for law students and young attorneys who share its views. Professor Barrett, if my understanding is correct, the payments you received from ADF were connected to presentations you delivered at ADF's training seminars. Is that right? Yes, I gave a one-hour presentation on constitutional law. Mm -hmm. And you delivered these presentations to law students participating in the Blackstone Legal Fellowship Program. Blackstone is an ADF program. Were you aware of that when you accepted their invitation to speak? I, I, I actually wasn't aware until I received the honorarium and saw the ADF on the check, or maybe when I saw an email and saw the signature line. But yes, ADF is the organization that sponsors the so Blackstone. You weren't aware of it? When um, I... Senator Franken, I can't remember exactly when I became aware of it. I was aware of the Blackstone program for some time. Well, you were not aware when you when the gig. By the uh, time I by the time I spoke, I was aware. I can't remember exactly when I was aware, but are for you, present uh, purposes, let's, is it your habit of accepting money from organizations without first learning what they do? Senator, I'm invited to give a lot of talks um, as a law professor, and it is not, I don't know what all of ADF's policy positions are, and it has never been my practice to investigate all of the policy positions of a group that invites me to speak. So, so if you got, um, you know, let's say in the uh, 70s, I, I did lectures, and say Pol Pot, had asked me to speak, but I didn't like check it out. Do you think that would have been good judgment? No, Senator, and if I were invited to speak by Pol Pot or by the KKK um, or a group like that, I would certainly decline the invitation. But I think it's a long way um, from... Well, let me just tell you this, that Blackstone's affiliation with ADF is clearly stated on its website. The first question on Blackstone's frequently asked questions page is, who created the Blackstone Legal Fellowship? The answer reads, Blackstone Legal Fellowship is a program of alliance defending freedom. I mean, this is a group that fights against equal treatment of LGBT people. This is a group which calls for the sterilization of transgender people abroad. I was not aware of that. Well, that, that begs my question again. So you will speak to anyone who pays you? Um, you don't check out who they are? I mean, if they're the uh, lobby for dogs and puppies and uh, American pie, but happen to be, I don't know, anti-Semitic, you wouldn't do any research? Senator, again, if I were invited to speak by a hate group, if I were invited to speak by the KKK well, sounds like or like the that ADF kind of group, is something of a hate group, doesn't it? Senator, that was not my, um, that was not what my interactions with Blackstone were like. The people who I interacted with, we had a wonderful group of students from Notre Dame go. I never witnessed any discriminatory conduct in any way. I never had a whiff of that. My presentation was about constitutional interpretation. It had nothing to do with those topics, and it just was not my experience. I didn't have... Do you, do you know what the Southern Poverty Law Center is? I learned it recently, yes. You learned it just recently? No, I'm sorry. I thought you were going to ask me if I knew about the Southern Poverty Law Center's classification of ADF as a hate group. And no, yes, I didn't I ask you that. that. What I asked you was a simple question. I do know what the Southern Poverty Law Center is. Okay, what are they? What do they do? Um, well, I'm speaking generally. Um, I'm generally aware that the Southern Poverty Law Center um, fights discrimination and that they do classify some groups as hate groups. Yeah, they do classify some groups as hate groups. 
Yeah, they track hate groups. And you spoke at an event sponsored by one of those hate groups. Senator, now, I question your judgment. The root word of judgment is judge. Senator, with respect, I did not have that impression of ADF. And ADF, um, if it were truly a hate group, it wouldn't be co-counsel right now. It has a brief in the Supreme Court with Wilmer Hale, which is one of the most reputable and um, esteemed law firms in the country. And they wouldn't be co-counsel with ADF if it were a hate group. Um, I, I assure you they wouldn't be co-counsel with, with the KKK. I gather that the Southern Poverty Law Center's designation of ADF as a hate group is controversial. I didn't learn about that until more recently. But again, that was not my experience with the Blackstone program. Um, so I is, had it, nothing is it your position that no hate group has ever filed or co-filed a, um, a brief to the Supreme Court? I haven't researched that question. That is not my position. My position is that a very well-respected law firm would certainly not serve as co-counsel on a brief with a hate group because, as you say, if there's a hate group, just like I wouldn't give a speech in front of a hate group, I wouldn't give a speech to the KKK, I think that... But uh, you yourself said that you don't take it upon yourself to research who you're speaking to. So how do you know? I mean, not many groups call themselves the KKK. Only one does. But there are plenty of hate groups out there. So if you yourself said you had no idea when you gave this, when you accepted this speech, you didn't do any research into them. You are saying to me that you don't uh, vet who pays you to give a speech. Now that to me is irresponsible and shows bad judgment because I used to, the Pol Pot was a pretty extreme example but I would vet whoever asked me to speak, especially and, uh, whether I was speaking for free or I was being paid. And it seems to me that this demonstrates extremely bad judgment. Why don't we ask for an answer, Senator, and then we'll move yes, on. Yes, Senator, I, I would like to say it wasn't, um, I had several colleagues who had given lectures in the Blackstone program, and as I said, we had several groups of law students, students that I found very engaged and that I liked very much, who had gone to Blackstone, so I was aware of the program, and I respected both the students and the faculty who I knew had participated in it. So again, I had, it wasn't, I had no reason to think it was a hate group, and that was certainly not my experience of it. Okay, can I ask one last question then that just deserves an answer? Sure. Okay. I'm a little confused. Do you vet groups that you talk to or not? Because when your first question, uh, first response to my question was that you don't. So I want to ask you, was that answer truthful? Perhaps I can, yes, it was truthful, but let me say this. If I received a random invitation from a group that I had never heard of and had no experience of, I would look it up and try to figure out what it was. In this particular context, I had heard of the Blackstone program. That sounds like your first statement who, wasn't truthful because your first answer okay, was that you okay. don't vet That I don't look up every policy position that a group invites me, that a group before whom I'm speaking might have because I don't feel like member uh, affiliation with a group commits me to all of that group's policy positions. I will say, Senator, that if, I, if it was a group that I had no idea who they were, of course I would try to figure out who they were before I accepted an invitation. I had a general sense of the Blackstone program and respect for those who I knew who were participating in it. Thank you. Senator Cruz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Welcome to the both of you. Congratulations on your nominations to positions that make an enormous impact for our country. Um, let me ask each of you, what makes a good federal appellate judge? Professor Barrett? Um, I think a good federal appellate judge is one who is impartial, who is um, unyieldingly committed to the rule of law, um, who does, gives equal rights to the rich and to the poor, um, 
who is not will, who is um, willing to willing to take the consequences of rulings that might be unpopular. Um, so one who is brave. Judge Larson. Um, I agree with everything Professor Barrett just said. Um, I might add to that uh, in terms of process. I think someone who listens, someone who listens carefully to the arguments of counsel on both sides, someone who listens to her colleagues. Um, one of the things I have learned uh, in my two years on the Michigan Supreme Court is that often my colleagues uh, teach me a lot through oral argument. I come to oral argument and I hear the interactions between myself and counsel, but I learn a great deal from the interactions uh, with my colleagues and counsel. Um, and taking all of those different perspectives uh, into my own judgment has really helped me uh, be a, what I, I hope to be a good judge. Um, and I hope to bring that to bear if I'm lucky enough to be confirmed to the Sixth Circuit. So let me ask both of you the flip side of that. How would you define a judicial activist? Well, Senator, I think a judicial activist, um, I know that term gets thrown around a lot, uh, but the way I would define it is somebody who doesn't take the law where it leads her, but rather who comes in with a preconceived notion of a result that she's trying to achieve and then looks for precedence or support in whatever source uh, to find a way to get to that result. That would be a judicial activist, and um, I would disavow that. Um, I agree with Justice Larson. I would add that a judicial activist, I think, is one who decides a case based on something other than the rule of law. For example, personal policy preferences, political preferences, who's unwilling, as Justice Larson said, to follow the law where it leads. Uh, and would I be correct in understanding that both of you are committed to being faithful to the law and constitution irrespective of whatever policy or political preferences you might have. Yes, Senator Cruz. Yes, Senator. Um, Professor Barrett, let, let me ask a, a different question that I'd be interested in your views. I've, I've, I've read some of what you've written um, on, on Catholic judges in, in capital cases. Uh, and, and in particular, uh, as I understand it, you, you argued that Catholic judges are, are morally precluded from enforcing the death penalty. Uh, little, just a little bit narrower than that. Just okay. That, that, I was going to ask you to just please explain yeah. your views on that because uh, that obviously is of relevance to the job for which you have not been nominated. Yes. Um, Senator Cruz, that was an article that I wrote 20 years ago as a third-year law student with a professor, and it addressed a very narrow situation, a situation in which a trial judge who was a conscientious subjector to the death penalty was asked to impose or was required by the law to impose an order of execution. And we concluded in that article that recusal would be the judge's best course. And the judge should recuse from that case. And we insisted repeatedly in that article that in no circumstance should that judge, should that conscientious objector simply try to twist the law to match that judge's own belief about the death penalty. We did not draw any conclusions about um, conscientious objection in the appellate role. And as a law clerk to Justice Scalia, you know, he was the justice for the Fifth Circuit, you know, the, the circuit in which Texas um, is situated. Um, we handled many capital cases in our chambers, and I participated in all those cases, including in the relatively common circumstance where the right answer was to recommend a denial of relief. So you, you did not recuse yourself as a law clerk I did in capital not. cases. And, and is it fair to say it is not your intention as a blanket matter re to recuse yourself in capital cases if you're confirmed? Correct, Senator Cruz. Um, Professor Barrett, in, in 2006 and 2016, uh, you were named Professor of the Year at Notre Dame. I was. Uh, that is, is a, a high honor. Um, why do you think it was that you, you received those awards? Gosh, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I think students generally choose professors who they admire, who have challenged them. I was very grateful and honored that those classes chose me. And what has been the most rewarding aspect uh, of being a law professor? 
Working with students. I love working with students. I love challenging them. Um, I love learning from them. It's really rewarding to teach young lawyers how to think like a lawyer, as the saying goes. Um, that's really been the best part of the job, and, and getting to know students outside of class as well. Uh, Justice Larson, how would you answer the same? Well, in my years of teaching, that's exactly what I would say as well. Um, there's, there are professors who uh, are more interested in the research side and professors who are more interested in the student side, and I certainly would have put myself on the student side. Um, I greatly enjoyed the interactions with students, uh, with the teaching, getting to know them through various activities. I was the clerkship advisor. I ran the moot court program. Um, so uh, I very much enjoyed my time with students, and some of my students uh, are in the gallery today. I'm honored by that. Well, I will say both of you have had long and distinguished careers that hopefully are just getting started. Uh, and you began your careers clerking for giants of the bench, uh, two of whom are sitting behind you, and, and we are grateful for their great and honorable service for many decades, uh, and one of whom I'm quite certain uh, is looking down from above uh, with a big Italian smile on his face, <laughs> and, and I have no doubt uh, that Justice Scalia could not be more proud. Uh, of the tremendous job the two of you have done and the tremendous job you will do being faithful to the law. Uh, I, for one, and I know many of my colleagues, we don't want a Republican judge. We don't want a Democratic judge. We want a judge who will follow the law. And I appreciate the commitment both of you have given to do exactly that. Senator, Senator Feinstein has another question. question <clears throat> of both of you. If you believe a precedent of the Supreme Court conflicts with the Constitution's original meaning, would you follow it as a judge? Do you believe it would be unlawful for you to do so? I do not believe it would be unlawful and I would follow it as a judge. I would give the same answer. Why is it that um, so many of us on this side have this very uncomfortable feeling that, you know, dogma and law are two different things. And I think whatever a religion is, it has its own dogma. The law is totally different. And I think in, in your case, uh, Professor, when you read your speeches, um, the conclusion one draws is that the dogma lives loudly within you. And that's of concern when you come to big issues that large numbers of people have fought for for years in this country. And I listened carefully to what Senator Whitehouse said because um, he spent a lot of time on this whole issue of dark money moving out and controlling and the president's litmus test. And um, I assume if both of you were on the lists that you would be a no vote on Roe. And that puts a number of us just very honestly, in layman's language, is in a very difficult position. So I want you to understand that. If you have a comment, be pr appreciate hearing it. My comment would be um, that as a justice of the Michigan Supreme Court, and also if I am fortunate to be confirmed to the Sixth Circuit, I would, I don't, the, 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 there's no opportunity for me to be a no vote on Roe, and I would not be. I would be bound by the precedents of the Supreme Court of the United States. Do you know for almost a quarter of a century, every single person before us has said they would be bound by precedent? I remember when Senator Specter was chairman, to all that super precedent, someone that went on the Supreme Court said and then got there and voted the other way. 
And so, you know, you're under oath. And I assume people mean what they say. But over time, we learn to also judge what they think and whether their thoughts enable them to be free to observe the law. Would you like to make a comment, Professor? Um, I agree with Justice Larson. Um, I'm being considered for a position on a court of appeals, and there would be no opportunity to be a no vote on Roe. And as I said to the committee, well, I would faithfully apply all Supreme Court precedent. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. You bet, Senator. I have another question. Why do you why do you think why do you think that uh, more judges don't decide constitutional cases cases that have a constitutional issue on the basis of their state constitutions as opposed to the federal constitution? More judges in federal courts? No, in state court. Let's start with state court. Let's suppose someone raises a constitutional issue, mm -hmm. and the constitutional issue is addressed by both the state Bill of Rights and the federal Bill of Rights. Why do you think more state judges automatically look to the federal Bill of Rights as opposed to the state Bill of Rights? I'm thinking this might be a question Justice Larson is better equipped to answer, but um, Senator Kennedy, I guess I would say that I think it probably depends on how litigants frame the issue. And if litigants are framing the issue as one under the state constitution, then I'm sure state judges would approach it that way. But not having been a state judge, I don't, I don't know the answer, you know, from, from that perspective. Okay. What, what is your, if I could ask, your litigation experience, Professor? I practiced for, I clerked for two years, and then I practiced for two years in Washington, D.C. Okay. Who'd you, um, who'd you practice with? Uh, the firm was Miller, Cassidy, LaRocca, and Lewin, and then it subsequently merged into Baker Botts. Yeah, good firm. Um, and then I joined the academy, and I did cease practice when I became a law professor, although I have been involved in the nitty-gritty of the courts through my service on the advisory committee to the Federal Rules of Appellate Procedure, and I teach the bread and butter litigation classes like civil procedure and evidence and those sorts of classes. Okay. Have you ever argued an appellate case? I have not argued an appellate case. Okay. Um, back to my original question, Judge. So um, I think uh, that although Professor Barrett hasn't served as a state judge, she did hit it right on the mark. Um, at least in my experience in the Michigan Supreme Court, we rarely see litigants claiming that the Michigan Constitution differs in any meaningful respect from the guarantees, for example, of the Bill of Rights of the U.S. Constitution. Um, and as a judge, uh, we take the arguments of the parties that they bring to us. Um, now, sometimes there are cases that arise only under the Michigan Constitution. Um, so we have decided a few cases uh, related to particular allocations of authorities between the state government and municipalities that obviously wouldn't arise in the federal constitution. But in my two years of experience, I don't think that any litigant has brought us a claim suggesting a divergence between federal and state issues on, on Bill of Rights matters. And, and do you feel free as a justice to uh, look at your state constitution first, right. even if the uh, litigants don't raise a, a state constitutional issue? Well, no. I think that, if, uh, that as a judge, we have to take the cases the way they are framed to us by the parties. Um, and so if a party brought me a question and they said, uh, we want you to decide this only under the federal First Amendment, for example, um, I would not feel that it was my role to insert uh, the Michigan Supreme Court analog um, if they didn't bring a claim under the Michigan Constitution. So if they are only claiming under the federal Constitution, I would only construe the federal Constitution as guided by the Supreme Court of the United States. So, so this will be my last question. So, so if, if the parties come to you and say, here's the case, and we want you to decide it under this statute. Uh -huh. But you happen to know there are other statutes that are equally relevant, maybe more so. You're going to ignore those other statutes? That is one of the hardest questions um, that you get as a judge. 
um, because in this country we believe in party control of litigation. That is that the litigants bring us the claims. Uh, and so what's hard is to know Normally, you would expect that one party would bring you the relevant statute and another party would bring you an opposing statute and say, no, this one controls over that one. Um, but what if the parties miss it? And that is one of the hardest questions that I've faced as a judge is how much do you do the litigants work for them and how much do you let the litigants shape the arguments themselves? I can't speak uh, in any particular about that except to say that that's a tough question as, as a judge. Um, ordinarily, the what, right rule is the What if you've got two control. stupid lawyers who miss the old issue and they give you the wrong case law? Or they give you a statute that is sort of on point, but there are three others over here right on point? That's a, you don't just let it be controlled by the litigants, do you? Well, um, for example, in a criminal case, if that were to happen, um, we would hope that there would be an ineffective assistance of counsel claim uh, brought in order to provide relief to a criminal defendant whose uh, lawyer missed the governing statute. Um, but the claims are generally shaped by the parties. That's the way litigation Don't you think uh, that's in America a waste works. Of scarce judicial resources. If well, you, if you see it right there in front of you. Well, perhaps there are. Um, there might be a better way to design a system, uh, but for nearly 200 years, I think that the American system of justice has operated through an adversarial system, mm. um, and the adversarial system really depends on counsel. Um, and that's why uh, I think it's critically important, especially with respect to criminal cases, uh, that we have adequate representation for criminal defendants, because I can't do my job as a judge unless the parties bring me the best arguments on both sides. That's interesting. Okay, well, I've stalled as long as I can here, waiting for Grassley. <laughs> I think we're going to need to move the second panel. Thank you both very much for your Thank testimony. You. It's been, been a very interesting day. Leave the pencil. I don't think I can come to judge. Oh, yeah, just Let's get started, folks, if we could. <laughs> Gentlemen, would you raise your right hand, please? Do you affirm that the testimony you're about to give for the committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Thank you, gentlemen. Please be seated. And we will start with your opening statements. How long do they have? Five minutes each. We'll begin with you, sir. Well, thank you, Senator Kennedy and Ranking Member Feinstein and members of the committee. Uh, thank you for holding this hearing today and uh, to consider my nomination. I also thank the President and the Attorney General for the confidence they have placed in me by making this nomination. I would like to begin by acknowledging family members who are here today. Behind me are my wife, Laura, and my children, Madeline, my daughter, uh, and my son, John and William. I am blessed by their love and support. And I'm thankful that my children have the opportunity to attend this hearing and see how our government works. If confirmed to serve as the Assistant Attorney General for Civil Rights, uh, I will be honored to return to public service. 
I served previously at the United States Department of Labor and the United States Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. In those positions of public trust, I did my best to enforce the law effectively and fairly. My goal always was to remedy violations of the law, hold lawbreakers accountable, obtain relief for victims, and ensure compliance with the law. I'm especially proud of my service at the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. As general counsel there, I was responsible for the Commission's litigation and enforcement of several civil rights laws, including Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the Equal Pay Act, the Age Discrimination and Employment Act, and the Americans with Disabilities Act. I was honored to work with hundreds of dedicated career attorneys, paralegals, experts, and staff. And when I served at the Commission, our, our, our litigation program successfully enforced the civil rights laws. We began the Commission's systemic discrimination enforcement initiative, and we filed hundreds of lawsuits and recovered several hundred million dollars on behalf of victims of discrimination. These numbers include records for the highest amounts recorded by the Commission's litigation program in both a single year and in a multi-year period. Many of our cases were precedent setting. For example, we successfully prosecuted and resolved a very large sex discrimination case against a major Wall Street firm, a large race and sex discrimination case against a national retailer, and an egregious sexual harassment and discrimination case against a vineyard. These cases provided relief to women and men, and we obtained court-ordered changes uh, to, in order to ensure prospective compliance with the law and equal employment opportunity. In hundreds of other cases, we achieved significant relief for other victims of discrimination, including victims of race, color, sex, national origin, and religious discrimination, age discrimination, disability discrimination, and other forms of unlawful discrimination. Thousands of people benefited. I've also served in the private practice of law, and I've represented a wide variety of individuals and organizations. My clients have included a victim of a police shooting, multiple individuals who faced decades in prison, another individual who faced the death penalty, and small and large corporations. I have represented these individuals and organizations during investigations and in litigation, and I have endeavored to help them solve their legal problems and to advise them about how to comply with the law. If confirmed, I would emphasize the same commitment to compliance and with and enforcement of the civil rights laws. I care deeply about the fair and zealous enforcement of the law, and particularly the role that the Justice Department and the Civil Rights Division play in seeking to protect the civil rights of everyone in the United States. Like the many public servants with whom I have served, the attorneys and staff who work in the Civil Rights Division have devoted their professional lives to the vigorous enforcement of the law and the protection of the civil rights and civil liberties of all Americans. If confirmed, my job will be to support their efforts and to manage and lead the Civil Rights Division. As part of that responsibility, if confirmed, I will work with and listen to these public servants, and I will work to support the Division's vital mission. I thank you for holding this hearing today. I also thank the Chairman, uh, the Ranking Member, the other members of this committee and their staffs for considering my nomination, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. better turn my microphone on. Mr. Camel. Thank you. I'd like to thank Senator Corker for his kind introduction earlier this morning. Uh, thank you, Chairman Grassley, Ranking Member Feinstein, and the entire committee for uh, having me here today. I also would like to thank the President for the honor of his nomination. It is an honor to be here today. I would like to introduce my family members and a guest in attendance and acknowledge other important family members and friends who could not be here today. First, I'd like to introduce my wife of 23 years, Anastasia Parnum Campbell. She's an amazing wife, mother, and a very accomplished attorney who works in state government in Tennessee. With us also is our youngest son, John, who is missing a few days of third grade to be here with me today. Unfortunately, my other two children, Hannah Britt and Liam, could not be here today. But I'm so proud of my wife and family and I'm blessed to share my life with them. Also in attendance today are my parents, Bill and Beth Campbell, my older two sisters, Ann Calton and Missy Markham, are back in Nashville. I'm thankful for the values that my family taught me, including the importance of hard work, a strong faith, integrity, and humility. I would also like to acknowledge my wonderful second family, my father-in-law, John Parnum, a retired state court judge, and my mother-in-law, Wanda Parnum, 
who is in Pensacola, along with my sister-in-law, Brooke Jones. Finally, I'd like to thank a special uh, friend who attended earlier, but unfortunately had to leave for another commitment. Uh, she was here with us earlier today. Susan Hussey is a longtime friend and a successful lawyer in Baltimore. Susan is the widow of a dear friend, Naval Academy classmate, and fellow Marine Captain Brian Hussey, who we tragically lost with three other fine Marine officers in a 1996 training accident. It, I was really honored to have Susan here with me earlier today. My wonderful family, along with my friends and colleagues at my law firm, Frost Brown Todd, are an inspiration to me and a blessing in my life. I look forward to answering any questions the committee may have for me and have confirmed to serving our country and our, my home state as a district judge. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Camel. Now, Mr. Parker. Yeah. Chairman Grassley and Ranking Member Feinstein, I'm truly honored and humbly humbled to be sitting before you today. I greatly appreciate your willingness to hold this hearing and the other committee members as well. I would like to th also thank Senator Corker for the kind introduction this morning and along with Senator Lamar Alexander from Tennessee for considering me and recommending my name to the President. I'm very grateful and honored that the President accepted that recommendation and nominated me for this position. With me today is my wife, Allison. Like my father and my siblings before me, I married up 23 years ago. I am the luckiest man in the world that Allie said yes. She is the love of my life, my best friend, and my champion. We are blessed with three daughters, two of whom are with us today. Catherine, age 21, is here from her senior year at the University of Georgia. And Annie, age 19, is a rising sophomore at Northwestern University. Our youngest, Ellen, is 15 and is at home in school today. I'd like to mention a few others who are not able to be here with us. My parents are Pe Pete and Peggy Lee Parker. My dad is deceased and was an alcoholic until the day he died. Thankfully, over the last 15 years or so of his life, he was in recovery. He taught me that life is a journey, that opportunities for growth are around every bend, and the importance of serving others. My mother, who will be tuning in from Memphis today with her husband, Buddy, at 86, she is one of a kind, a courageous hard worker, sweet to the core, and the most consistent optimist I've ever known. I've learned more from her than I would ever be able to share today. I'm the youngest of five children, as Allison is. So we have a number of siblings and in-laws and other family and friends back home tuning in. They have all been a huge source of support for me over the years, and in particular during this process. My brother-in-law, Buck Welford, is an outstanding lawyer, law partner, and friend. He has done so much to help me uh, along the way. There is no way that I could ever repay him or thank him enough for his counsel, friendship, and support. If I am fortunate enough to be confirmed for this position, I will look no further than my father-in-law, Harry Welford, as an example of how a judge should conduct one's life. A devoted husband, he was married to Catherine for 62 years until she passed away in 2015. He is now 93 years young. After serving as a district judge in Memphis, he then served on the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals. He is well known for his distinguished legal intellect and mind, but more importantly, he is known as a fine man and a great guy. Patience, humility, and good humor are three of his characteristics that immediately come to mind. Chairman, thank you for indulging me for a few minutes, and I look forward to your questions and those of the committee. Yes. Uh, by the way, uh, Senator Alexander, uh, for the two of you from Tennessee, wasn't able to be here to introduce you but he does have a statement in support of your uh, nomination by the president, and that will be put in the record without objection. <clears throat> I'm going to start with Mr. Dryban. Uh, as you know, this year marks the 60th anniversary of the Civil Rights Division. If confirmed, obviously you lead that division. <clears throat> 
the horrific events that unfolded just last month at Charlottesville <clears throat> were a devastating reminder of the importance of civil right enforcement at the department. As I said before, I believe the actions of white, <clears throat> of white nationalists and other hate groups in Charlottesville clearly constitute domestic terrorism that we cannot tolerate in this country. <clears throat> I realize that if confirmed, you may lead the department's investigation and that may limit your testimony on this matter. That being said, this is an issue that weighs heavily on the hearts and minds of senators of this committee and the American people. To the extent possible, I'd appreciate it if you could uh, comment on the events at uh, Charlottesville. Uh, see how much my staff's on top of everything. <laughs> Wasn't your staff? <laughs> I'm, sorry. I'm sorry. It was Senator Feinstein's staff. Thank, thank you. You're thank welcome. you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I'll, I'll note that. I thank couldn't resist much. that. <laughs> so I'm back to business on Charlottesville, Mr. Geisman. Uh, you served for several years in the EEOC before going into private practice 12 years ago as someone who, uh, uh, I'm going to ask the question, but I also want you to comment on your thoughts on Charlottesville. So let me w wait until you uh, respond where I took my drink of water. Oh, sure. Sorry. Uh, with Chairman Grassley and, and Ranking Member Feinstein, uh, the, the events of Charlottesville were, I thought, a terrible tragedy and a disgrace. As an American, we should never tolerate the kind of hatred and violence that was on display there. Uh, and my, my hearts and prayers are with the victims uh, of the violence that happened in Charlottesville. Um, I was very encouraged uh, to see that the Attorney General uh, immediately responded to the events in Charlottesville by announcing uh, a civil rights investigation uh, of those events. My understanding, uh, and I'm a private citizen, I do not have access to the, the matters there, but my understanding is that the investigation is being coordinated between the Civil Rights Division, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, and the United States Attorney's Office. If confirmed, I would do everything I can to support the investigation. I'd like to add one other thing, too. The bigotry and ide ideology of neo-Nazism, Nazism, white supremacy, and the Ku Klux Klan are a disgrace to this country and should be eradicated from the United States. And if I am confirmed, anyone who perpetuates crimes, or other civil rights violations that come within the jurisdiction of the Civil Rights, civil rights Division should know, and they should be on notice if I am confirmed the Civil Rights Division is coming for them. Having said that, I am not here to prejudge the investigation. I do not have access to any materials uh, or any investigative materials at this time because I am a private citizen currently. But if confirmed, I will support it. Uh, and I will support it vigorously and bring any of those to justice who we are able to bring to justice. Okay. Mr. Dryban, uh, you served for several years at the EEOC before going into private practice 12 years ago as someone who has both prosecuted cases for the EEOC and defended companies investigated by the EEOC. You've been on both sides of your fair share of discrimination cases. Can you tell us your thoughts on the view of an advocate for a client versus a public servant advocating on behalf of the American people? How have both roles prepared you for the job for which you're, you've been nominated? Well, Chairman Grassley, uh, the, the roles of, a, of an attorney in private practice uh, are very, is a very different role than, than an attorney who is uh, representing the United States uh, at the Civil Rights Division or the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission or in any aspect of our government. In private practice, lawyers are ethically bound uh, to zealously advocate for their clients, uh, to represent them uh, and provide candid legal advice, to represent them at times in court, to represent them and advocate for them during investigations, for example. Uh, an attorney in private practice also has a duty to advise uh, clients about how to comply with the law. In public service, however, the roles are very different. The, the, the attorney, uh, whether it's at the Civil Rights Division or at anywhere at the Justice Department or 
at the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission or anywhere in the federal government has a duty to the public interest, uh, has a duty to seek justice, uh, and, and, and to do justice to the best of that individual's ability on behalf of the people of the United States. And that is a very different role uh, than uh, an attorney in private practice. I've been blessed and fortunate to, to have been uh, uh, able to serve in both roles, uh, in both as a private practicing attorney uh, and in, uh, in public service. I will say in private practice too, I think one of the roles of an attorney at times is to advise uh, clients that there are times when uh, litigation, for example, or um, just a, a, a defending itself is not often, the, or it's not always the best way to go. And, and there are times when, uh, as in my own experience in private practice, I've worked with government attorneys to bring about uh, positive resolutions to disputes, to settle discrimination matters, for example. Other times, uh, clients have chosen to litigate or challenge the, those matters. And uh, I think having done both, uh, I think it prepares me well to, to serve in, in public service as I once did. Uh, it certainly gives me a perspective on uh, what defendants may be facing or respondents to particular government investigations. Senator Feinstein. Thanks uh, very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, because of the hour, and I think both sides have caucuses that are important today, which began some time ago. Um, I'm not going to ask questions of Mr. Campbell or Mr. Parker. I think your credentials are pretty clear and good and solid. And so you kind of lucked out on me. And uh, I think your son is quite wonderful back there. And he's behaving very, very appropriately, which is always good. Um, Mr. Dryband. Um, I'd like to talk to, with you a little bit. Um, I am concerned whether you will be active sufficiently to be very blunt about it. Uh, you lead a very, will lead a very de important uh, department, and that's Justice and Civil Rights Division. And if ever hate crimes are up, as you know, hate groups are up. Um, the nation is divided. Um, Non-white communities feel that they have nobody really representing them. How do you look at this? Uh, what will you do within the Civil Rights Division to exercise real leadership and strong leadership to say that we are one nation, we are one people, nobody's rights are going to be trampled on. That's the first part. Then maybe the second part would be, what would your strategy be to achieve uh, that kind of leadership position? Mm -hmm. Uh, Senator Feinstein, I agree with you entirely that, regrettably, we are a divided nation now. Uh, my, uh, one of my focuses, if I am confirmed, would be to do everything I can to, to unite people, including in the Civil Rights Division and including in the matters pending before the Civil Rights Division, of course. With respect to whether or not I would aggressively or zealously enforce the law, which I think is what you're, you're asking me, uh, what, I would, what I would say is a couple things about that. Number one, in my prior public service, when I served at the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission and when I served at the United States Department of Labor, I always favored zealous enforcement of the laws, including the civil rights laws. As I said in my opening statement, we set records uh, during my tenure at the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. And when I interviewed for this job, I told those who interviewed me that if, if they wanted to nominate me, they should know up front that I favor zealous and vigorous enforcement of the civil rights laws and all of the laws within the jurisdiction of the Civil Rights Division. If I am confirmed, that is the message that I will send to the Civil Rights Division attorneys, the section chiefs, the career staff, as well as the political appointees. Um, with respect to hate crimes, uh, I think you raise an excellent point. Hate crimes are terrible. They come within the, the jurisdiction of the Civil Rights Division. The criminal section uh, of that division does prosecute uh, hate crimes. Uh, in my prior experience, we, we prosecuted a human trafficking case. It was very akin to the type of hate crime. I also think on the rise, human trafficking. Yes, and, yeah. I, and Senator Feinstein, if I am confirmed, 
the prosecution of hate crimes and human trafficking, and especially sex trafficking, will be a priority of mine at the Civil Rights Division. I favor zealous enforcement of the, the hate crime laws and the human trafficking laws within the jurisdiction of the Civil Rights Division. When I served at the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, for example, we were able to prosecute uh, a, a human trafficking case involving workers who were tricked into coming to the United States from India, lied to, held under uh, a guard, armed guard at times, paid substandard wages and so forth. And my colleagues, particularly out of the EEOC's Dallas office, successfully prosecuted that case. I was very proud of them for, for doing it, supported those efforts, and would take the same approach if confirmed to serve at the Civil Rights Division. Well, I, I hope that you will be of help to us. Many of us on this committee have been both sides very active uh, in producing legislation in the trafficking, particularly the child trafficking area. And there's one area remaining, and that's the advertising of young girls, children on the Internet that we are trying to work out. So we would hope that you would work with us um, in that area. Uh, let me ask you a couple of things. So this one surprises me, and that is that in 2008, you testified against the Lilly Ledbetter um, legislation, uh, <clears throat> and that was a Fair Pay Act. Uh, as you know, um, the Supreme Court threw out her pay discrimination case uh, just because she didn't sue Goodyear within 180 days of the company's first decision uh, to discriminate against her. Um, why would you be opposed to equal pay for equal work? Uh, Senator Feinstein, I have, am not opposed to equal pay. In fact, I fully support equal pay uh, for all Americans without respect to their gender or their race or anything else. Um, the testimony that I gave was not in opposition to the Lilly Ledbetter Fair Pay Act. Rather, my testimony was, was directed at the, the issue that the members of Congress were expressing concern about. What I recommended was that the Congress codify the equitable tolling doctrine and the equitable estoppel doctrines, which are the doctrines that the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission has recognized to deal with hidden discrimination. And so what I, what I was testified about was not that equal pay uh, somehow uh, is, is wrong or, or, or not. In fact, when I served at the EEOC, we prosecuted many, many sex discrimination and other forms of discrimination equal pay claims, including, as I said earlier, a case against a major Wall Street firm. So my testimony was, was essentially advising the committee that there was an alternative that, in fact, if enacted, would be broader than the bill that was then pending before the committee. Thank you. I'm glad you clarified that. The chairman's just entering the room, but I'm certain he would Senator, recognize Senator, Senator Cruz. Thank you, Senator Feinstein. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you for being here. Thank you for your willingness to serve. Congratulations uh, on your nominations, all three of you, to positions of, of high trust and confidence. Uh, let me start with Mr. Campbell and Mr. Parker, just so you guys don't feel neglected on this hearing. Uh, and. Let me ask the both of you, uh, how would you define judicial activism? Uh, I'll start, Senator. Thank you for the question. Uh, as was referenced in earlier testimony before this uh, committee, that, that seems to be a term that people uh, define in, in lots of different ways uh, and use for lots of different purposes. Uh, I'll, I'll answer the question as I understand the term to me which is that uh, a, a judge or a group of judges uh, attempts to, uh, to use their position to reach a certain outcome and, and actively pursue that outcome as opposed to faithfully applying the rule of law to the facts of the case before it. That's, the, the latter is what I would take an oath to do, and that's what I would intend to do is to be faithful to the rule of law not try to inject my personal opinions or my pers any personal agenda uh, on the outcome of a case. What does that mean? Mr. Parker? Senator, thank you, thank you for the question. Uh, I agree with everything uh, Mr. Campbell uh, just said. Uh, when, when a judge is presented with a case, um, the, the issues that come before the, the judge have got to be decided based on the law and not on any personal belief that the judge may have going in. 
uh, when I hear the term judicial activism, uh, typically, at least in my experience and my understanding, it's used uh, when uh, judges are uh, deemed to uh, have an in justify the means sort of approach uh, that their personal views would override whatever the law says, and that's uh, not my understanding of what uh, a good judge would do. So do both of you commit to this committee and to the American people that if confirmed, you would be faithful to the Constitution and laws of the United States and follow the law rather than imposing whatever policy preferences you might have? Absolutely, Senator. Absolutely, Senator. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Dryben, I describe for the committee your tenure uh, as general counsel of the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission and, and the major uh, accomplishments uh, while you served there. Well, um, when I served at the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, we had a very active litigation program. We filed more than 400 lawsuits every year. Um, we set records, and it wasn't me. I mean, it was me working with the career staff. We had several hundred attorneys there. Uh, they did outstanding work at every level of the federal courts, uh, the district courts, the courts of appeals, and with the Solicitor General's office working with, with, in the Supreme Court of the United States. Uh, and many of the cases were precedent setting. But I'd like to talk about one case, if I could, Senator Cruz, and, th and that's a case that, that meant a lot to me at the time and still does, and it's not a case that, that sent any major precedent. There was a matter uh, that came out of our St. Louis office when I served as general counsel of the EEOC. It involved a, a, a case of a, an individual who was totally deaf. He applied to work as a low-wage dishwasher uh, at, um, at a fast food restaurant in that area. The manager of the, the, the restaurant told him that he would not hire him, and he would not hire him because he was deaf. Uh, blatant disability discrimination. The matter came to my desk. I sent it to the commissioners for a vote. Uh, two of the commissioners expressed concern. They said, you know, th this case doesn't look strong enough. We're suspicious of this deaf dishwasher applicant. I was a little surprised by that, but uh, I, I called our St. Louis office and I said, you know, we need to, let's in interview this, this individual again because commissioners are expressing concern. Uh, they did. They, they, they looked him up. They found him in a small town in, in, in Louisiana where he was living uh, a very meager uh, existence because of not being hired for this low-wage job. We dispatched an investigator out to this small town in Louisiana, in interviewed him. Uh, we, we sent the case back up to the commissioners. They approved my recommendation to litigate the case. We filed suit. And we recovered about $25,000 for that individual. And I think while that case did not send any precedent, wasn't particularly uh, novel in any legal sense, it was particularly important to me, and uh, it's something I'm particularly proud of, that the United States government was able to, to seek relief for that individual uh, and to send a message to the public that that kind of blatant discrimination will not be tolerated. Thank you, Mr. Dryman. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, uh, and congratulations to all three of the nominees uh, before us. Uh, thank you for your commitment to public service and for your um, willingness to uh, sit before this committee today. Uh, Mr. Dryband, um, if you'll forgive me, I'm going to focus uh, many of my questions on you because of my uh, interest uh, in your area of uh, work, uh, the subjects um, that we discussed in our previous conversation, um, and my concerns about a few areas uh, where um, if confirmed, you'd be a decision maker um, in some important policy concerns. So let me turn to that if I might. Uh, first on voting rights, um, when we had our uh, meeting, you said you intended to zealously enforce uh, civil rights laws in particular, including uh, the Voting Rights Act. Uh, but during this administration, we've already seen the Civil Rights Division back down from enforcing the Voting Rights Act. In Vesey versus Abbott, uh, after six years of litigation in this case, the Justice Department recently dropped its claim uh, that Texas, uh, that their voter ID law was passed with the intent to discriminate against racial minorities. Um, less than two months later, a federal judge found the law was passed with such discriminatory intent. Uh, do you think the Civil Rights Division was right to abandon a meritorious claim of intentional racial discrimination under the Voting Rights Act? Well, Senator Coons, uh, when we met and we talked, I agreed entirely with you and I agree with you today that the Voting Rights Act is, is one of the most important laws within the jurisdiction of the Civil Rights Division. Uh, it's a law that grows out of the 15th Amendment to the Constitution of the United States, prohibits discrimination uh, in voting. 
Uh, certainly, and I did say, and, and will say again today, that I zealously support enforcement of the Voting Rights Act and will do so if I am confirmed. With respect to the Texas matter that you're, you're referring to, uh, if I am confirmed, I will review the matter uh, and I will exercise the best judgment I, I can about what the facts, the evidence, and the law mm -hmm. require. Uh, I have not reviewed the record in the case. I am not privy to what the Justice Department has in front of it uh, because I'm in private uh, citizen right now. Sure. But if I'm confirmed, I will review the matter and uh, take any appropriate action. I appreciate that answer. Just tell me um, what process you would put in place, uh, if confirmed, um, to review a case before the Department withdraws a claim or changes its position, because uh, I've got two other cases I'd like to discuss where I think there have been similar uh, changes in position that are concerning. Well, as a general matter, the, the Civil Rights Division is divided up into different sections. Mm -hmm. uh, sec each is headed by a section chief. Um, what I anticipate doing, if I am confirmed, is meeting on a regular basis with uh, the deputies in, in the Civil Rights Division, with the section chiefs, and, and initially talking with them about how I can best help them enforce the law. Uh, with respect to particular matters, I would anticipate, if confirmed, that I would review the record in the case, uh, review their recommendations, have you know, discuss uh, with the lawyers working on the particular matter uh, what the record shows what their recommendation is, and then uh, use my own judgment to take appropriate action. Thank you. Let me ask you just a few more questions, if I might. It, uh, to close on this point on the VZ versus Abbott case, uh, the Fifth Circuit noted that um, although the stated rationale uh, for the voter ID law was in-person voter fraud, uh, there had only been two convictions for in-person voter fraud out of the last 20 million, 20 million ballots cast in the United States. Um, do you believe voter fraud is a widespread, significant problem, and are you aware of any evidence that millions of people voted illegally in the 2016 election? Uh, uh, Senator Coons, I am unaware of the data about voter fraud in the United States. I am not aware of any data about what I think you're asking about, which is whether or not there were millions of votes cast, uh, or fraudulent votes cast in the 2016 election. I'm just not aware of that data at Neither all. Neither of us are aware of that data, and I, I'll, I'll just assert for me, I don't believe that data exists. So my hope is that if confirmed, you, you will, in fact, vigorously um, defend uh, the access to the ballot box. Let me ask a last question. Uh, in February, uh, the Department of Justice and Department of Education uh, both acted to withdraw the previous administration's guidance um, stating that schools should allow transgender students to use bathrooms of their choice in order to comply uh, with Title IX and, and other civil rights laws. Uh, then in April, the Civil Rights Division dismissed its claim against North Carolina uh, for its uh, similar bathroom bill. Um, in your view, does Title IX protect transgender students? Um, do you understand why a transgender student would believe that the Civil Rights Division um, now is not actively protecting their rights? Um, and then help me understand how your role in defending the University of North Carolina uh, in challenging uh, uh, North Carolina, in the case that was challenging North Carolina's uh, bathroom bill, would affect your future uh, actions and, and what conclusions uh, transgender students or their families uh, might draw from that. Okay. Uh, well, I certainly think protections uh, for for individuals against discrimination, including sex discrimination, and in, in cases like the Shepard Bird Hate Crimes Act that protects against uh, hate crimes because of uh, gender identity status, uh, are in very very important. Um, with respect to the department, the Department of Education, the Department of Justice's decision to withdraw the, I think the guidance letter you're referring to, uh, that is not something, of course, that I've had, had any role in. Right. Uh, my understanding is that the departments are, uh, are announced when they withdrew that letter. Uh, that they will uh, review the matter, and, and they may be doing so now. I don't know because I'm a private citizen. With respect to the University of North Carolina litigation, certainly I would recuse uh, if uh, advised by any ethics uh, officials at the Justice Department, and I would consult with them if I am confirmed uh, about that matter or even more broadly whether or not my role in that case uh, warranted recusal more broadly. Um, with respect to the university's position in that case, I think it's important to note that the university did not in any way uh, monitor access to bathrooms by anybody. The university uh, did not enact the law that the Justice Department challenged, and the, the representation that we did in that case involved simply a procedural defense to explain to the court 
that the University of North Carolina had no role either in the enforcement of the law or creating the law and did not intend in any way to monitor access to bathrooms. So if I am confirmed, I would initially consult with the ethics officials at the Justice Department uh, and, and, and take their guidance on how to proceed with, because of my prior involvement. And thank you for that answer, and thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, for allowing me the extra time to pursue that line of questioning. Um, congratulations to all three nominees for your time today and um, um, your willingness to serve. Thank you. S Senator Blumenthal. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I join and thank you for your commitment to public service. Uh, Mr. Bryband, uh, my understanding of the 2018 budget is that it cuts 121 positions from the civil rights division that you have been nominated to serve. Would you commit to us that you will oppose that kind of cut? Well, Senator Blumenthal, uh, I, I'm not familiar with the details of, of any budget. Certainly the budget is something that the Congress of the United States establishes. Uh, well, you're, you're going to be an advocate for your division. I assume you would oppose that massive cut of 121 positions because it would severely disadvantage your division. We've all been in places where we have to advocate for the departments or divisions or offices that we had. You've been in the EEOC. Wouldn't you consider it your responsibility to oppose that kind of cut, which would disadvantage, in fact, possibly disable your division for all of the good intentions and plans you've expressed here, uh, you can't enforce without attorneys and investigators and person power. Senator Blumenthal, I, I agree with you that the Civil Rights Division needs resources. Uh, and certainly, if I am confirmed, uh, I would view my role as being an advocate for the C Civil Rights Division of the United States Department of Justice. The only thing I know about the budget proposal that I think you're referring to is that, as I have been told, that, that the proposed budget would enable the Civil Rights Division to maintain its current staffing levels. But whether or not that's true, I don't know. Um, if I am confirmed, I will review uh, the budget, the budget proposals, and, and speak with the career staff in the Civil Rights Division and, and uh, make any recommendation that I can to my superiors. Uh, I, I want to uh, express the hope that you would be a zealous advocate and that you would familiarize yourself with uh, the budget in, in detail. Uh, and I want to come back to the Ledbetter issue because I hadn't intended to talk about it, but I was uh, somewhat confused by your responses to Senator Feinstein. Uh, you testified against the Fair Pay Restoration Act, correct? Uh, Senator Blumenthal, I, I appreciate the question. Uh, there seems to be some confusion about my testimony. Well, you testified against the act. In fact, you said that the bill, in your view, would not advance the public interest. You said it would result in, quote, limitless monetary penalties, because, end quote, because of significant costs it would impose on employers. And I take your contention that you're in favor of fair pay. I didn't expect you to come here and say you're in favor of pay discrimination. But in fact, that act was about enforcement of that right, correct? Uh, Senator Blumenthal, and, that... And let me give you my understanding, because you testified against it, that it changed the limitations provision so that people like Lily Ledbetter, who were discriminated against, wouldn't have to prove that discrimination within 180 days of the initial decision. They could prove it within 180 days of the discriminatory paycheck. And without that change in the law, there would have been severe obstacles to enforcement. And you testified against that law which reversed the Supreme Court decision in the Ledbetter case. Am I correct, roughly? Uh, Senator Blumenthal, I think that is not a correct statement of my testimony, and I, okay. I'm delighted to have the opportunity to clarify my testimony. The Civil Rights Act of 1964 was, was the main bill that was at issue, or the main statute that was at issue with the, the Fair Pay Act. Uh, I always testified and have never suggested otherwise uh, in favor, I've always testified in favor of equal pay, number one. Number two, 
the structure of the law is such that the Civil Rights Act seeks to, to have a prompt remedy for any discrimination. What was the concern of the members of the committee at the time was that there was this hidden discrimination problem, that when people are unaware of discrimination against them, there ought to be an extension of limitations period. This was exactly the point raised by Justice Ginsburg in her dissent in the Ledbetter case. And so responding to both Justice Ginsburg's testimony, or dissent, and the concerns by the proponents of the bill about hidden discrimination, what I su suggested as an alternative to the bill that was then pending was that the Congress codify the equitable tolling doctrine because that would achieve the result that the members were expressing concern about. That is, that would extend the limitations period in both paid discrimination cases and, if codified, in all other forms of discrimination cases, including hiring and pay and promotions. And so my concern was that the bill, as narrowly drawn, was limited to pay and was a one-size-fits-all event that dealt with pay, whereas the equitable tolling doctrine applied broadly to all forms of discrimination and could result, if codified, in the extension of the limitations period for all victims of discrimination. We could have a longer conversation, but my time has been exhausted. I just want to ask you one last question. Would you agree with me that the Ledbetter Act or the Fair Pay Restoration Act has not produced what you call um, major costs for employers? Well, I'm not familiar, Senator Blumenthal, with the data uh, uh, about how that statute has been enacted. I, I would agree generally that in my own experience, uh, the law, uh, the, the statute creates um, I think a bit of confusion in the law about record keeping obligations, but otherwise, uh, I think as a general matter, we have not seen the litigation that I think uh, that I would have expected. And I, you, would, you would be committed to enforce it zealously? Oh, of course. Uh, the Congress made its judgment with that bill. That bill is now the law of the land. It is an amendment to Title VII of the Civil Rights Act. If I am confirmed, uh, I would zealously enforce it. No question about it. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, Senator Ronald. Senator Hirano. Thank you. It's good to see you again. I, I apologize if any of these questions had already been asked, but I, I had a conflict, so I'm back. Uh, regarding the Lily Ledbetter issue, you testified on that, um, that when the, I don't know whether it was in the House or the Senate that you testified, but it doesn't matter. You provided testimony and you said that you disagreed with the, the, the uh, when we had our discussion, basically with the approach that that, that bill encompassed, that you're, you did not take the position that we should not have clarified the, the um, statute of limitation provisions, I take it, but that you thought that the uh, bill should have gone another way. That, that was what you had conveyed to me. That's correct, Senator Hirano. What, what I, and, and thank you for your question, and, and thank you for taking the time to meet with me yesterday. Uh, the, the, the testimony that I gave about that bill mm -hmm. uh, recommended to the committee that the committee uh, uh, address the issue that was of concern broadly. That is, the concern was, as Justice Ginsburg wrote in her dissent in the Ledbetter case, that there is a problem when discrimination is hidden and unknown, and that people in those circumstances should be relieved of the statute of limitations period. So what I, what I testified about was that a broader remedy to the problem that the members of the committees were expressing uh, would be a codification by, in the statute of the equitable tolling doctrine, which would enable an extension of limitations period. On the other hand, the, the, uh, the Congress did not uh, take you up on your suggested remedy. And, and frankly, from a process standpoint, I don't know what, what kind of showing one would have to meet the uh, requirements of the tolling provisions that you, you suggested. It may have been more of a burden on a, on a complainant to go that route. But you also had noted in your testimony, and I believe that Senator Blumenthal got to this um, question about some consequences that, uh, that you noted in your testimony. And as far as I know, I've, I've uh, made certain inquiries and those kinds of consequences have not arisen. And uh, uh, so as far as I'm concerned, the, the Ledbetter uh, uh, law is working in the way that we hoped that it would. Let me turn to something else. Uh, one of the major uh, missions of the Civil Rights Division would be, of course, to, to uh, prosecute 
discriminatory actions by, by corporations, employers, et cetera. And uh, part of what's happening in our environment is that we have, uh, we have a rise in hate crimes. We have uh, various kinds of, of behaviors and statements being made. And frankly, uh, Mr. Trump's, uh, President Trump's response to the violence in Charlottesville was to blame people on both sides and to give his approval to what was essentially a march of Nazis and white supremacists. And the, the Civil Rights Division has been described as the crown jewel of the Justice Department because it is responsible for vindicating so many rights fundamental to our values as Americans. Do you believe that you would have a special responsibility as the head of the Civil Rights Division to speak out against people promoting, and not only to speak out, but to prosecute people promoting hate on the basis of race, religion, sexual orientation, and uh, some of the other bases that uh, you are charged to enforce? Senator Rano, I do. Uh, hate crimes, and hate crimes on the, uh, of the type that you described are a serious problem in this country. Uh, we saw, as you described accurately, uh, a terrible uh, display of that in Charlottesville, Virginia recently. Um, there is no place in this country for neo-Nazism or white supremacy or the Ku Klux Klan or the ideologies of hatred, bigotry, discrimination, murder and other crimes those people and people acting on those ideologies have committed. If I am confirmed, uh, the uh, hate crimes that come within the jurisdiction of the Civil Rights Division will be a major priority of mine. And in fact, I was totally disgusted by the disgrace that we saw in Charlottesville. And one of the reasons I'm here today is because I would like to lead the Civil Rights Division and in both in investigating that matter and any other matter that comes within its jurisdiction. Well, I know that uh, hate crimes have increased in our country and uh, uh, to the extent that, that, that there are ways that, that should you be confirmed, uh, any role that the Civil Rights Division has in prosecuting or assisting in going after people who espouse uh, violence and who in fact engage in violence and going after um, hate groups I hope that you will make a com commitment that that is exactly where you know you would spend your resources, some of your resources. Senator Hirano, uh, I, I will certainly commit to uh, focusing on and bringing to justice anyone in the United States who perpetuates a hate crime uh, with, that is within the jurisdiction of the Civil Rights Division. Uh, let me add one other thing. I, I, there, I do not in any way uh, prejudge the investigation announced by the Attorney General into the events of Charlottesville. Mm -hmm. um, I don't have access to any of those materials. If confirmed, I will certainly support the investigation and follow the facts and the evidence where they lead. So before I totally, well, I think I, do you mind if I, could I ask one more question relating to voting rights? Yeah, please, go ahead. So a, a part of what the Civil Rights Division has to prosecute is making sure that uh, uh, our voting rights laws are, um, are uh, enforced. So uh, the Supreme Court did away with a major part of the Voting Rights Act. And under, uh, there, there's still remaining provisions that would allow the, the Justice Department, I presume your division, should you get this appointment, to check, uh, to review what states are doing with regard to limiting rights or suppressing uh, voting rights. Is this something that would be high on your list of priorities to review? Yeah. Uh, Senator Hirano, yes it would. The Voting Rights Act is, is fundamental to who we are as a people. The right to vote is sacred uh, to our right as American citizens and any violation of the Voting Rights Act is something that I would take very seriously if I'm confirmed and uh, would, would zealously prosecute any lawbreakers. And you are aware that after the Shelby County decision that it's already 13 states and more are probably following, passing various kinds of laws that would, in, in uh, many people's views, suppress vo voting. And so I, uh, I hope that you will, in fact, go re review these kinds of, of laws with a great deal of, of, of uh, with aggressively is what I'm <laughs> going for. If confirmed, yes. yeah. If confirmed, I expect to meet with the uh, head of the voting section at the Civil Rights Division and review the matters that are pending there and uh, support uh, aggressive and zealous prosecution of the Voting Rights Act. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have some other questions that I will submit for the record. Let me announce at this point, because of just what she said, the record will be open, I think, for a week. 
And so you'll get a lot of questions from members that aren't here as well as members that are here. So it's very important that you promptly answer them so <coughs> when your time comes up to get on the agenda, we can get you on the agenda. Senator Whitehouse. Thank you, Chairman. <coughs> Um, I'm not going to concern myself too much with the district judges for Tennessee, being from Rhode Island, but welcome. And I must tell you, since you've been looking at us and I've been looking at you and the folks behind you, that your families have been very well behaved, including young ones. So well done. Um, Mr. Dryband, we have some unfortunate history with the Civil Rights Division, as you well know, under Attorney General Gonzalez and uh, Civil Rights Division Director Schlotzman. Um, the Inspector General of the Department of Justice and the Office of Professional Responsibility of the Department of Justice had to go into that department, had to investigate it, and came up with the determination that that division had actually violated federal law. So forgive our concern about having to go back to those uh, dark days when in the environment in which we're happening, I hope you can understand that these questions are very important to us and it's really important to us particularly to people who I think have served in the department, that it not go back there. Can you assure us that you will not conduct yourself in such a way that the Department of Justice Inspector General and Office of Professional Responsibility end up going into the division that you ran and describing it as having been in violation of law? Well, Senator Reithaus, I am generally aware of the Inspector General's findings in the matter you're referring to. Um, I was not a part of the Civil Rights Division uh, at the time, um, and uh, I, I believe those matters mostly related to issues about hiring. Um, hiring people who had yeah. predispositions who would not give the folks on the other end the public a fair shake is kind of, I think, the rough fair way to describe it. Yeah. And I just want to make sure that you're committed to preventing the Department of Justice from being put in that situation again in the Civil Rights Division as you run it. Yeah. Senator Whitehouse, I'm not overly familiar with those matters. What I am committed to is full compliance with the civil service laws and hiring the best talented people I can find without regard to their political affiliation or anything other than their abilities as a lawyer or an investigator or a prosecutor or whatever the case may be. Fair enough. Um, go back to your story about the deaf dishwasher. Okay. Remove his deafness. Insert, instead of being deaf, that this individual is gay. Does he get treated the same way by uh, you under the Civil Rights Division? Well, the issue of whether or not, it depends on the law. If, you, if you're asking about Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the sex discrimination prohibitions in that law, uh, that is a matter that is currently uh, in litigation and pending before the United States Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit. Uh, my understanding uh, as a private citizen is the Justice Department filed a brief that said one thing, that the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission filed a brief that said another thing, and, and I, I think it would be inappropriate for me to, to comment on the matter any further, and we'll await what, and see what the Court of Appeals does. So what do you think about that, just as a person? Should dishwashers be fired because they're gay? Uh, I think everyone should be treated with respect. Uh, and, and treated without regard uh, to any trait unrelated to their work. Does, um, at the moment, to follow back on, um, I guess it was Senator Blumenthal's questions about illegal uh, voting, um, there is a theory that millions of people voted illegally in the last election I don't think that there's been any factual support for it, although it has political appeal for certain people who like to say that. Um, there has also been a uh, election integrity, so-called, commission established, which appears to me to be stacked with the kind of people who like to make that political claim, notwithstanding the complete dearth of any evidence to support it. Here's my concern. If the allegation that millions of people voted illegally and the whole theory of voter fraud is in itself a form of fraud, that it is a false claim that is being asserted, and if based on that false claim this 
very stacked appearing so-called um, Election Integrity Commission then goes about making recommendations or pursuing policies that would systematically limit or try to obstruct access to the ballot for groups that are protected by the Civil Rights Act, would you be willing to tangle with that apparatus knowing what the political backing is behind it? Senator Winehouse, access to the ballot is critically important uh, and it, it is something protected by the Voting Rights Act. Uh, my duty and, and my obligation, if I am confirmed, will be to enforcement of the Voting Rights Act and other laws within the jurisdiction of the Civil Rights Division. If I am confirmed, I will take an oath to defend and protect the Constitution of the United States and the laws enacted under it. And that includes the Voting Rights Act. Uh, so if Even if it bumps you up against a so-called Election Integrity Commission? <laughs> Uh, yeah, I'm not familiar with what the Election Integrity Commission is doing. Uh, and, you know, what I will do is enforce the laws within the jurisdiction of the Civil Rights Division, uh, whether anybody likes it or not. Good enough answer to end on. Appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, meeting adjourned, and congratulations to all of you. Thank you.